Everything looks good. All right, we're rolling. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Face the Truth. Um, we've got an awesome artist this week. Uh, I first met him a, a year ago at the Lightbox um, convention in Pasadena. Uh, we did a panel together, got to meet him briefly, but just amazing artist. So I'm super excited to talk to him. He's done, um, from what I know, uh, looking through his portfolio, lots. I mean, it's a ton of book covers. It's crazy. It's almost overwhelming. It's so many. It's amazing. Um, but Star Trek, um, uh, X Men, and, and uh, I know you did a bunch of stuff for like Game of Thrones or like the, the author of Game of Thrones, or whatever. Anyways, just a truly amazing artist. I'm super excited. So everyone, please welcome John Picasso. Everybody, good to be with you, man. <laughs> good to see you, man. So, uh, yeah, this is great. Like, I like I said, I was um, like, I didn't know who you were until we met last year. Yeah. Uh, and I looked you up. And I'm like, holy crap, this guy, <laughs> this guy has done like so much work. Um, it's amazing, man. Um, and my first question right off the bat is um, just having to do with your tech, your technique, because um, I. I, I can't tell if it's digital, traditional, like it's hard to tell. I mean, it's very, and that's a good thing, I think. But that is good. Um, I love that question when I get asked that. So I figured I would ask you because I can't really tell. <laughs> no, cool. no, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm a hybrid. So that's why maybe it's a little bit slippery. Um, so the recipe I've been basically using for the last, what, at least decade of my work is it, everything is sort of like a high intensity graphite drawing. Um, working out all my values in graphite and then scanning or photographing that drawing. And then um, basically the, the colors happen in Photoshop. I used oh, to cool. uh, do these, um, sorry, acrylic paintings that I would uh, scan in. And they were almost like these abstract paintings that I would scan in and then use those as my palettes and build those up as layers and sandwiches. Um, I think these days though, I kind of just um, basically more, just more or less tone it in Photoshop. And, and work my colors in Photoshop. I mean, I, it's it's still a mixture, I would say, actually, of those some of those acrylic paintings scanned in yeah. as palettes and Photoshop. But in, in the end, it's Photoshop. It's digital color. Yeah. Uh, okay. Rarely do I paint traditionally <clears throat> all the way through. Although there are plenty of covers where I have done that in the past. Uh, yeah. But I think I've just kind of found my mode where, for me, drawing is where the joy is. So I spend most of my time on those graphite drawings. That's awesome. Yeah, that's it's it's a really good look, man. It's really cool. Right. I got a I got a friend of mine um, who, um, and he he does a very similar thing. He does just like these crazy long graphite drawings. Zach Meyer, he's an awesome illustrator. Oh wow! And um, but it's crazy. Like I he's he brought me some of his drawings, and I I that's when I first found out that that's what he was doing. I couldn't believe it. Like these just amazing graphite drawings that look like they took forever. And then he colors them in. Um, but it's a great combination. You know, that's a really nice mix. Yeah. Um, uh, I was like, you know, you can draw that in Photoshop too. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, but that that's really cool though. So how big are those drawings that you're working on? Are they pretty like it's... large size? Yeah, they tend to vary. But I mean, I think in general, my stuff tends to go around 14 by 21. Kind of in that, okay. that um, a lot of the Loteria stuff is 14 by 21. Really, I guess, really, actually, the image area is a little smaller than that. In the end, I think it really ends up being about an 11 by 17 ish, 13 by 19 ish kind of size. So, I mean, that's not that's not terribly huge. Uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, you use up a lot of pencils. <laughs> well, yeah. A lot no, of that's it. awesome. I always love when I see people still doing traditional stuff, you know, these days because. It's, 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 <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's very strange. I think I, I personally got into the illustration game right at a weird place where I was still doing everything traditionally. And then when I decided to try digital, it was looked down upon, like, yes. you know, and now it's like almost everybody, you know, so, um, I still try to do traditional, but I don't, I don't ever do it for, um, like clients unless it's like a, basically if it's a private commission, then I'll do oils and stuff like that. Um, so I find it, I always find it fascinating for people that are in the illustration world that are still doing things traditionally, just because, 
Um, I understand the, the the stress on that. That you know, the art directors come in and they're saying, "Hey, yeah, we want all this changed," and yeah. you just want to like yeah. scream out, go climb a mountain and scream or something. But do you find that um, with your work? Do you have to um, imagine with really elaborate graphite drawing, and then there's some kind of changes like that's got to be really crazy. No, you know, it's like, um, gosh, uh, where did I learn this? I'm trying to think of where I would have learned this from. Really, I guess from comic book techniques. I mean, I grew up loving comic books. Comic books for me are like the first language. Uh, we can get into that later if you want. But I've, I've never worked professionally, truly in comics. But in a way, comics are kind of what got me my start into book covers. And again, we can mm. talk about that later if you want. Yeah. But like, you know, in comics, I don't know, if, you know, when you look at original art, a lot of times you'll see paste ups, you know, where you'll see like where they had to make an, an, an edit or a revision to the drawing and they'll cut out, you know, like do another oh, drawing yeah. and cut it out and drop it in on top of the original art, you know, cutting around the silhouette or whatever of the face or the figure or the building. And um, I've done that a number of times where there's a revision, even where I'm art directing my own stuff. And I say, that's not, that's not working. You spent yeah. all this time, you did six different versions. It still didn't look, doesn't look good. And you'll come back fresh and, because you work that area so much, you just basically say, no, I'm just going to do it on a new piece of board and plop it on. And, and, and um, yeah, so I'll do like paste up sometimes where I'll just drop it into the original art. I like having an artifact. I think for me, yeah. something gratifying about it, but also it helps revenue, you know, where there are mm -hmm. collectors who buy those originals. And so um, it's both yeah. a personal gratification and an artifact. You though, I look at your work, like that thing you just finished. And I forget for what magazine, I think it was, was it the, Washington Examiner? I, I'm trying to think what it was. Oh, uh, yeah, political thing I did. Yeah. It was with the 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 COVID piece, Trump yeah. White House, yeah. and you were on a tight deadline. And I can't imagine having, I mean, they did do that stuff traditionally back in the day, but you like had two hours to do the color work on it. It was crazy. So yeah, that's what wow. digital, I mean, thank God, you know. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, you're, I mean, even, it, I still think that even super strong, it's like, yeah. You know, it's so it's it's funny because I have a lot of friends that do what I do as well, and and then I'll I'll see them get a, like the next cover or something. I'm like, what? You got two people with a white background? What? What? Why does this happen to me? Like it seems it seems like every single time there's some there's some kind of curveball. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like wait a minute. You, like the the art director for that last that cover you're talking about, he goes, oh, I got a really um a fun a fun one for you. It should, should be pretty simple because. Uh, all the likenesses are going to be really small, so you can just simplify it. And I'm like, dude, that's six, no, seven people yeah. in like less than two days. And, oh, you know, wow. so, wow. yeah. So, I mean, but that for me, like, to be honest, like that, that was a mad rush. Like I, I really didn't spend too much. Like I, I did those faces as fast as possible. It worked, um, man. It was yeah. Crazy. I even like looked down there at the guy cutting the grass and that, that, that didn't look like you hacked that out either. I mean, it looked, it, it all worked, man. Your focus, yeah. it needed to be with those areas, but even the guy down there cutting the grass at the base of the white house there <laughs> looked cool too. You know, yeah, but you, you know, it's funny, a little inside baseball, which I, I'm sure you. So the guy, the la the guy you're talking about mowing the grass, um, that was, um, that was the last thing I did and I painted him probably in like 20 25 minutes not even maybe it's really quick if you zoom in it's really loose like it's oh, yeah. but yeah. the thing was is i only i found references of guys mowing the lawn and this one guy he was perfect because the lighting was coming from a certain way and the reference it matched I'm like oh this will this will be perfect for what i was just like look at the shadows and and then the art director last minute said hey i want to flip the guy the other the face him the other way and going this way <laughs> So now, like, my reference doesn't work because <laughs> the lighting is completely wrong. So I had to – I basically just made it up. I'm like, okay, well, just pretend there's a shadow here from this. And, um, But, yeah, see, the, the, like, with, with your work, you – like, I can't imagine um, – like, you know, this is actually a good timing to talk with you because I'm about to start – very soon start a book cover and then a few uh, full pages for the book. Ooh. And um, – and I have, you know, and I, and it's going to be more like sci-fi type uh, style, which is a, some, something I don't do a lot of, but I'm excited to jump into that. Um, how much time do you usually get for something like that? Uh, That's a good Because I'm hoping I don't, I'm not, I'm hoping that I'm not going to be like, oh yeah, we'll just 
in a couple days, you know, I don't like that would freak me out. Yeah, that <laughs> that would be a problem. I mean, editorial, as you know so well, I mean, those deadlines are so tight for these periodicals yeah. and covers in general. I mean, the the lead, the lead time is a lot longer. Um, you know, from the time an author turns into manuscript to the time it gets put out into publication, it's usually about a year. So in that year, all these production things happen, and that's where we come in, right? Where we do our mm. job. And, you know, it just kind of depends on when they decide to give that thing to the art director and the art director then, you know, decides to select an illustrator for it. And then whatever time is left, that's kind of where we're at, you know, because then it gets has to be handed to a designer to do the type on top of it. So to answer your question, how much time do I usually get? I mean, it's usually anywhere from I, I've seen it as tight as a month, which is a little too tight sometimes. Um, actually, most of the time that's too tight. Um, especially if you're stacking lots of jobs and you have a sequence going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> usually it's like s six to eight weeks, honestly, for me. That's usually kind of the, the turnaround times. Um, I would say, how, how long is your turnaround time? Are you, you know? It really depends. Um, I mean, I've done a few illustration jobs, like advertisement jobs I did last about a year ago now that were actually great because – they they paid really well and then which is always a bonus mm -hmm. and they gave me plenty of time and they were like giant like 30 something by i don't remember how these are huge posters that i did yeah. um and it was great because they gave me like weeks and i don't normally have that normally um like like basically like rolling stone i haven't worked with rolling stone for a couple of years um i don't know why but hopefully soon i love working with rolling stone yeah. but like all the paintings i've ever done for them have been two days tops, <laughs> and and one of my shortest deadlines ever for them was a portrait I painted of um, I have it over here, Rick Ross, yeah. um, Rick Ross, and they called me on a fr uh, Thursday night. This is a real quick, but we need it tomorrow, oh. and tomorrow afternoon. So I got up at five in the morning and did a portrait, and it was, and then so basically, a, like six hours, I think, oh, is. My God. Um, wow. but, it, but it forces you in, in those instances, like for me, it was like, okay, how can I make it look, still be publishable and professional? Um, I can be more painterly and expressive. Make, maybe that's going to force me to be a little bit more, um, and push myself a little bit more. Yeah. And I kind of look at it as like, okay, it's just a portrait. So I've got six hours to just do a really awesome portrait. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. So I try to I have to try to think about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but if but yeah. if it's a like a like some jobs you know they're complicated they want all these different characters and all these different things and that's just like that can be stressful. Yeah. But I, you know but again like it's different. I have done book covers before um, and I usually get more time for those. But yeah. um, it the editorial world it, it can be it's tight. It's tight. Yeah, especially when it when it has to do with like political stuff, you know, because that stuff changes so fast. The news changes, and right now, dude, it's like, <laughs> bet. what is happening? Oh my gosh, I get stressed out that there's so much going on that they've hired me to, to do something, and I, I'm like, by the time I'm done, is, is it gonna, is the story going to be changed? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> well, the zeitgeist changes literally by the hour. I mean, it's yeah, whatever, oh. whatever the meme is of the moment. So. I can't even imagine having to keep up at that, you know, hamster wheel pace. It's crazy. Um, yeah, it is a little nuts. <laughs> book cover thing, though. I mean, yeah. um, like, I don't know how much you're able to talk about the job that you're working on. But, you know, when you said you've got a cover and then you've got interiors to do with it, that's that usually tends to be a little bit of a longer. Yeah. End there than the yeah. normal, you know, we, we need a book cover for this book. And I'll also say that um, and different artists are different about this. So for a lot of the artists watching out there. You know, I'm sure a lot of you have gotten book cover commissions or maybe some of you are aspiring to get those. Um, you know, there's always there's different philosophies with different artists about how much you sort of invest in reading the manuscript. Or exactly. Even, yeah. You know, some jobs you don't even get a manuscript. And I'll say this to a lot of the artists still um, working towards it. I find these days that this wasn't the case back in the day, but these days I find it more and more that there isn't even a manuscript available because the writer might still be writing the book. Yeah, do a cover for, and that's not, that's no longer unusual to me. In fact, the one that I'm, I just recent, well, not recently, I finished it several months ago, but I'm actually working on some supplemental art for a promotion for this one book. Um, it's called Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse, 
It actually comes out tomorrow. The cover comes out tomorrow, um, or the book does. And and um, that one, yeah, she was first 50 pages in rough draft form. And that was what I had to go on. And these days, that that's even maybe a little more than some jobs, you know, give you. So yeah. it's just about you working through things with your art director and talking about the project and trying to come up with a, a visual that will compel people to want to invest in the story, even as the author is creating the story. So yeah, that's, that's got to make things a little bit more interesting too. Cause I mean, and you know, you've done so many now, obviously, you know, you want the artwork to be a perfect marriage with the book. Right. And also I think you, you want the, the cover to, you know, you want, you want someone to walk by and see it and go, damn, what is that? And pick it up, you know? So there's, there's a lot of different elements to it, but yeah. I was just I was just trying to I couldn't remember the name of the author right now um, or the book, but the particular project that I'm going to start sometime soon is um, and this author wrote this this book in the '80s, and it was a you know a big hit, and he's he's written several books, and now he's doing like a re um, like a reissue version, only 500 copies leather bound, and and wants me to do a brand new cover to update it. And it, it's 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 kind of cool because I started reading the, the the book's been written for a long time. So I went online and I started like reading about the book. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot. It's it's basically a, I, I guess it really influenced uh, the the Matrix quite a bit. Like it's very uh, much sci-fi um, has a lot to do with very similar things with the Matrix. So I started reading. I'm like, oh, this seems pretty cool. Like I'm starting to see things in my head already. Like of what I could try to. Yeah. Um, but it's this is kind of crazy because I was told maybe two months ago about this project, and they're still trying to nail things down. So I'm just kind of like, I keep I keep calling my agent like, so am I going to be starting soon? Because I'm trying to like plan with other, you know, um, you know, yeah. I want to make sure I can fo- get you know focus the time on it, and you know, Are you gonna read it? So Are you read it yet? Uh, I'm going I'm going to I'm gonna get uh the, I'm supposed to get like a copy of it. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I will say that my, my, my philosophy on these things tends to be, I, I don't, I can honestly work without a manuscript and just, you know, create a cover, as I have done several times in the last few years, w- without having a story to read. Yeah. Uh, and it is a tricky thing, because, you know, you don't want to do that thing where you create a cover that people look at and say, well, that doesn't match, or, you know, where it, it almost takes them out of the dream of the read. Um so yeah, it's a tricky, but I, I kind of like that stuff more and more now. I like that opportunity to almost because a lot of sometimes I've found even that my cover art might actually influence the story, which is that's an interesting flip, you know. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Those opportunities as an illustrator, but I wanted to say that um, for me, ideally, getting to read that manuscript and then sort of filter it through the way you sort of see the world, and then creating a cover image, you know, in conjunction with your art director. I mean, I don't know. I still get off on it, man. I've been doing this for 20, I guess, 20 years. I still love that. I mean, How many concepts do you usually come up with before you guys commit to? Three. I don't go, three. I don't go, I mean, two or three that I really sort of, I mean, I'll do lots of little thumbs for myself, but in terms yeah. of the process, um, I think part of it too, because I'm a lot of times when I'm reading those manuscripts, I'm taking up some of the deadline time already kind of absorbing the thing. Um, yeah, you know, and I, different art directors are, different styles in that sometimes even the art director may not have time to read the book and that's perfectly okay and yeah. that's also why i sort of feel like well that's my job i should i need to know it so that i can protect both of us <laughs> you know I, I don't want to give the art director something <laughs> the editorial and the publishing chain says what the hell is this so you know i enjoy that read and the art director it's not because they're dumb or or careless it's because they're swamped because they're dealing with so many they're yeah you know, all these jobs so they don't have time to read all these manuscripts so that's another reason why for me you know when it is available and when i can i love reading those things um but yeah I, my, I keep my thumbs and my comps to sort of a smaller selection set works out for me that's pretty cool you, uh, so yeah i mean i I'm, I'm trying to think about this i've been when i got this call for this job i started like like I said, I looked it up and luckily this book's already out. So I basically just started reading some stuff about the book and, and just getting kind of getting an idea. But what I, my approach to it would be once they finally have a go on this, yeah. I want to talk with the author. Okay. You know, that that's because that to me, that's like, Hey, listen, what are you looking for? 
like because he wrote it you know that's that's i, I really want to hear that perspective do you ever get to do that like or is it kind of like a separation there there is a definite separation between church and state there with a lot of the big five yeah. they're, they're okay. not down with, with you talking to the author but that's not your situation you're in a different situation so you don't yeah. have to that but i'm gonna tell you even though that's sort of this sort of unwritten rule where they kind of want to keep you separate um, I've, I've broken I've heard, it. That's why I asked you because I heard about this and it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm painting this thing for this book. Um, it's just strange. Like, wh why is why is it like that? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a couple couple of thoughts on that one. I I think some of it is actually good thinking on the publisher's part in that authors understand how to put words together to create images and stories. Mm. Uh, what they do, they're not necessarily the best at sales marketing and visual yeah that makes sense and if their opinions start to get in the way of sort of the larger machinery of the publishing chain that starts to create problems so mm. and i've seen that happen before not necessarily with my jobs but i've seen that happen elsewhere and yeah i can see what where they would be very protective about that um mm. the others sometimes can be egos i guess perhaps but again i haven't run into that but when i do go and talk to an author um it's generally after I've already sort of absorbed the thing for myself. So I've already got a, a take and an opinion. Mm. And because I have a take and opinion, I, I might have some gaps where I'm like, but if I only knew this or I had understood this motivation, this could really maybe kind of solidify my take on where I want to go with this. And that's maybe where I'll go to an author. So in other words, for you, I would say, once you've kind of absorbed the piece for yourself and gotten your own un, untainted take on it, if you want to, yeah, then go to the author and then you probably will have then some very specific things you want to ask yeah. that will in fact better inform you rather than going in without you having your take and having them in a way sort of taint and twist your view. I'm going to throw this one at you real quick. So like when I did my first book gig, it was back in the mid 90s, right? It was a book by Michael Moorcock. He's like one of the biggest fantasy authors on the planet. He's a giant and I was a complete green rookie. And I was taken to his house, in fact, um, at the time he had a few different houses, one in London, one in Spain. He had one here in Texas. So I got to go visit him here in Texas. And he, um, I sat down with him along with the editor and the uh, managing editor, uh, managing editor and publisher, I should say. And so I, I had some sketches of some things I wanted to do in the interiors of this book. And um, I said, hey, these are my thoughts. What would you like me to do, Mike? What are you thinking? And he said, you're the artist, you figure it out. And he didn't say it ugly. He didn't say it cold blooded, but he was very firm with me. Like it was succinct. And then he kind of turned away and went into a different conversation. I was just left sitting there on this couch thinking, huh, he didn't even want to engage me on this. Mm -hmm. And as they, when I, they drove me back to the, the hotel that day, um, I, I realized that he had done the best thing uh, a, a co-collaborator could do. He was basically saying, I trust you. You carry the ball. Don't fumble the ball and hand it back to me. You have the power. You're supposed to be the one visualizing this stuff. Uh, trust yourself is what he was basically saying. And he didn't mm. say it that way, but I, it definitely was what I ever got. And I got it on my first job early on. So I feel very fortunate. So I guess in a way I'm passing it to you in that I would say on this book gig, and it's not like it's your first one anyway, man, but yeah. enjoy that that experience of just, you know, absorbing the story for yourself and then yeah. the I mean, for me, it's the, the, for me, the only real difference is that I've, you know, I've never really done like fantasy type art or sci-fi art, which would, no, I, that's not true. I have done some, some here and there, but it's not something I do on a regular basis, but, yeah. um, but I'm, I, I'm excited about this kind of a project just because it's something different and it's, it's fun. And I like to, you know, kind of flex my muscles a little bit, you know, see what I can do. And, um, are you but, are uh, you yourself on this, or is the author art direct? Like, how does what's the relationship? With you? Well, does... that's that's the thing is I don't know anything yet. Like, it's <laughs> it's been like a couple months where I'm like, is what's going on with this? And then my agent says, oh, it's still happening. We're we're still like in the process. And I guess um, he, the author, has hired several. Or I don't know if it's the author, but whoever is part of this has hired several artists to paint a, a bunch of different books. Um, and so they're dealing with those first. And so I'm just like twiddling my thumbs, like waiting for this one that to, to happen. But, um, 
but yeah, I, that makes that makes a lot of sense what you're saying about the like the art director and the artist kind of or the, the author and the artist. But I always kind of think of like, you know, like the author is obviously it, it's it's this world they've created, and I would feel like this pressure. Like, am am I capturing that the way that? But but I, I see what you're saying because every single person that reads that book is going to see their own thing. You know what I mean? Like they're going to get they're going to have their own. And it's not really, you know, it's almost like when the author's done writing the book, he's it's kind of like, hey, it's got to let it, got to cut the cord. Yeah. It's gone, and now it's up to you to to create this world in your head, you know. The well, thing about so. it too is they're hiring you because of what they've seen of your work. You know, that was the thing that I had. I, what did, what had Mike Moorcock seen in my work before that? I had no book covers, but he'd seen these rinky-dink comic books that I had done, and just off of that, he said, "Yeah, I think you've got enough game to handle this." I, I wouldn't have had. The confidence that he had to tell a yeah. he like me that, but sort of distinct um, aesthetic to your work doesn't mean you've got to be caged with them that either. So I, I think it's, I mean, man, please keep me posted as this job. Hopefully, oh, I'll send you stuff when I start working on it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Get your opinion on things. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, great. you can say, yeah, this is not, this is lame, Jason. <laughs> um, I was going to say too, though, just real quick, is is. Um, don't worry about trying to match it to that author's world. You know, what they're bringing you in to do is to do something, to take them somewhere they couldn't go by themselves. You know mm. what I'm saying? If they yeah. already knew how to do it and what they wanted, um, then they would have done it or they would have done it with someone else. Yeah, so you that makes sense. Go in with that approach of like, I bring a certain set of skills to this and a certain way of seeing the world that's different from anybody else. And I'm going to apply that to this manuscript. And, you know, you don't get haughty about it. You're not going to get that way anyway. But you just kind of walk in with that approach and, and just have fun. and Put yourself into it. I always say make it personal. And, I mean, obviously you do that with your stuff. When I look at the editorial stuff you do, it's got a very sort of personal take in all yeah. the ways that you visualize faces. I mean, it's super personal. So, yeah, I think it's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. I'm I'm excited. It's it's always fun, I think, as an artist to to kind of, you know, jump into different, I guess, arenas. You know, like just to try different things and, like, when I for me personally, when like when I first got into illustration, I was all about caricature. That's you yeah. know, like my heroes were like C.F. Payne and, um, you know, a bunch of artists like that that were doing like editorial type work, Mad Magazine and stuff. Yeah. And then I got there. I started doing it, yeah. and that was great. But then I wanted more. I started, you know, I started seeing all this other illustration, like, in, like in, in different magazines that I wasn't getting asked to be in, that I wanted to be in. Yeah. And then I realized, oh, I gotta start showing people that I can draw portraits too. And so it's it seemed it seemed obvious to me because you know, obviously I can paint a realistic portrait yeah. if I can paint this caricature this way, you know. But people have to see it, you know. So then I started developing this, you know kind of that kind of a style yeah. and then started finally getting, you know, a wider range of illustration opportunities. And I think that's, that's really important. And when I look at your work, one thing that's really cool is that you, I, one thing I like about your work is the, the different layered elements of things in there. So it's not just like a person. It's like, like even the piece you got behind it's, you've got like this like layered of, of like with the flowers and then you like put in some skulls in there and all these different things. And it's just, there's like this depth to it. That's really awesome. And I think, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I guess when, I guess what I'm trying to say is like an illustration, I think it's really important to basically be able to draw and paint anything and everything. Right. You know, um, and sometimes people seem to get pigeonholed into like, I just, I just draw people wearing jeans and that's it. I can't do anything else. That's it. You know, um, I think it can be easy to get stuck in that, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think there's something though that I don't know, when I look across the gamut of, we'll just leave it at contemporary illustration or um, sort of the world of, that we work within, you know, our peers, the kind of people that show up at Lightbox Expo or Spectrum or, you know, the, the, the people that I, there, there's a lot of people that I am blown away by when I look at their technique and their craft, but the ones that really stick with me that, that I'm inspired by are the ones that usually have a take where there's, there's something, like, as I just said this earlier, something personal mm -hmm. that they... I think everybody tries hard and everybody puts themselves into the work. So let me just start there. I don't mean to say that not everybody's trying. Yeah. 
all of us are trying. All of us are putting our best effort into the, these things. But I think there are just some people that in there, there's something very personal that they're putting into the storytelling that's happening within even just a single illustration. And it's, it's something about the way their eyes and their brain sees the world. And I think we go back to that Moorcock take, you know, he, he wasn't just looking for someone who could draw well. He was like, what's your take? What's your take on the story? You know, I, I want to see that. Take me somewhere. Surprise me, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I know I'm extrapolating upon that very simple thing that he told me, but I, I really do believe that because I look at a lot of the artists that I think are really strong. And, you know, like I saw the Greg Manchus interview that you did, which was terrific oh, uh, thanks. on the podcast. And Greg's an example of somebody who, uh, you know, I mean, he does a whole range of subject matter, but the stuff where I really, you know, where it really knocks me out is where there's, there's something personal, you know, that he's kind of mixed in, whether it be into the, in the choice of elements that he has in the in the piece, or even in the way that he's composing them, you know, to where there's there's yeah. a, there's an opinion there is what I'm trying to say, and it doesn't have to be political, it doesn't have to be social, but you know, it's not just somebody saying I'm just trying to draw something well. There's something, yeah, in that. and I'm I'm always looking for that. That's what always clicks with me in resonance. That's a way better way of putting what I was trying to say. <laughs> I was trying to, that's exactly what I was trying to say is that it's like, it's one thing to be able to just, to, to be able to draw anything, but to, to be able to t take all these different elements to create something, to layer it, to, you know, there's a lot more depth. And, and another way that, you know, like you said, making it more personal, like, you know, I, I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of illustrators out there that like, I, I tend to really like illustrators and artists that are so very different yeah. than what I do. Like, it's, it's funny. I always get asked if I like, like certain caricature artists and I don't really like them. I'm not really inspired by caricature art. Um, I have a lot of friends and artists that I know that are really good and I think their work is great, but that's not the work I look at, you know, like I don't even think of myself that way. It's just, it's just art. It's just illustration and caricature is a tool, right? Um, but the, the artists that I look at that inspire me are so different. I think, like, I think one thing that's great about being an artist is to be able to, you know, fill our toolbox with as many tools as we want, and it can come from anywhere. You know what I mean? It can come from even even one of my favorite things to that I think all the time about this is um, when it comes to this kind of you know learning and growing and changing as an artist is like the magic of learning how not to do things like that's a great tool <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? like like yeah that that fucking sucked i did terrible but you know what i'm gonna learn from that and that's a tool you know that's something that i can grow from yeah. um and uh yeah it's 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 um it's it's also something as an illustrator that we never i don't think we ever stop <laughs> you no. know trying to figure out and trying to to better our work and you know um, I'm trying to think of this one artist that I'm, I'm blanking on his name and it's really bothering me. And I have, he's on the cover of one of my books that I have. Oh. Kind of give me some clues. Can you even give me a clue? I might be like, um, it's, it's so frustrating because I love his work so much and I'm just blanking. Oh, um, oh I'm just going to grab this really quick. Yeah, go go. Um, why am I still blanking? This is his work though. I don't know if you can see this. It's Sam Weber. Sure. Sam Weber. Yes. Sam Weber's terrific. Sam's um, work is great. Yeah, I don't know why I was blanking on his name. No, fantastic painter. You got it. Oh, dude. Yeah. He, he's one of those artists. Um, same, exactly what I'm trying to say is he, he makes it personal. He adds his own, his own elements and these just layers that are just like, oh, that's so great. Like that cover, for example, like this, the drippy honey added to the portrait and different things like that. It's just like make it so yeah. strong and magical and kind of my mysterious and yeah um i and just his, love his work and yet his stuff is very usually very sort of simple and iconic but it's not simple yeah. you know what i'm saying um yeah he's he's so super strong he really is he's fantastic yeah. i don't think i've ever seen a piece by him that i haven't been at least in some at some level sort of sucked in you know yeah. what you were saying earlier i just want to say that you know i think everything you said of course i agree with about um always having to evolve and grow but I think a lot of it too is is finding the buttons to constantly activate your own curiosity. I'm finding that really going back to the well of some of the things that always inspire me. I'm finding that 
some of those wells start to dry up. And so I'm in a mode right now where I'm kind of pushing myself even more to look at things that maybe before I really wasn't into, but trying to figure out maybe even why I, I'm, I wasn't, or, or maybe mm. even looking at them with new eyes and saying, well, how come you can't appreciate that? And then seeing if I can take some of that back into uh, not necessarily even my own work, but into activating my curiosity into different pockets. You know, um, a lot of times I think I, you know, I grew up liking slick lined comic book work, you know, your John Burns and your Terry Austin's and your George Pettis's. And now that stuff just does not connect with me at all, you know? Yeah. 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 Slick stuff. Um, <laughs> same, by the same token, real crude stuff didn't work for me either as a kid, but now I'm realizing that the really crude chunky stuff, I am finding my way into more and more now in terms of my own appreciation. I you wonder, mean, as far as like painter, like real thick paintings. Oh yeah. That's, I love that's my thing. I love it, man. <laughs> or even stuff like in just going back to comics, like like I didn't appreciate Jack Kirby when I was a kid. I mean, I didn't appreciate all that chunk, and now I now I'm completely in love with all of that chunk. You know that, that yeah. Uh, and it wasn't even Jack Kirby, I guess, because he wasn't do always doing the inking on his stuff. It's usually guys like Joe Sinnott, for instance. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm appreciating the chunkier. Um, more crude and raw stuff, the stuff that's just kind of slap it down one pass and, and go. Um, yeah. Okay. I love that too. I love that. I love like stuff that you can just, I mean, so for me, I work mostly digitally now as far as publication type work and stuff. Goes. I still want there to be that thumbprint. You know, I still want it to be, Hey, this is an original piece of art. I don't want it to be too digital or um, that sort of a thing. And so I'm super heavily influenced by just mostly a lot of traditional painters, but like also just painting traditionally um, whenever I can work on oils and stuff. And so one, one of the things that I like to do is um, as much as I can work traditionally. And then when I come back to working digitally, just try to like think about those, the, the effects and what, what um, we we're really lucky right now to live in the time that we do where digital painting has almost gotten to a point where it's really difficult to tell. Um, and it's, 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 it's become a lot more fun. And I, I spent, gosh, the first, I don't know how many years of my illustration career, just trying to come up with my own brushes and different things to, to kind of mimic that. And now it's like, Oh, everyone has them now. It's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> like, especially like on the iPad, like, um, I love, I don't know if you've messed on the iPad at all, but like the, uh, procreate, there's so many awesome effects that you can work and it just feels like you're really pushing paint around and it's a lot of fun and you can get like goopy looking, uh, strokes and different things. I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, and so I just think it's, it's really, for me, it's really important illustration wise to, to have that, I guess in this digital age where everything's mostly digital, I find that it can be really hard to stand out, you know, because there's so much work out there that just looks the same. And that's something that, I, that I'm always kind of concerned about or thinking about because, um, and then also there's, there's certain people out there that have like really done well for themselves and they have a very specific look. And if you go to, if you're like, Oh, I'm in, you know, they're like, Oh, you're just totally ripping that guy off because it's so obvious that you like, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. you gotta be really careful because it can be easy to be like, Oh yeah. You know, um, I don't even know if that made sense, but I'm just saying that like, yeah, it it's, I think it's a, it's a interesting, um, it's an inter interesting time as an artist from, at least from my career so far, because it's all been evolving at the same time that my career st has been around. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a weird time to like kind of become an illustrator. And I mean, it's been like 20 years now, but still it's, it's come so far where, um, now, like, like we said before, a lot of the stuff is digital yeah. and that's one of the things that I appreciate about your work is that, you know, I, I look at it and I'm like, I can't tell what it is and it doesn't matter cause it's just a piece of art. It's yeah. supposed to just be a piece of art, right? It, it shouldn't really, one of the things I hate the most is when people say, um, Oh, mm, that's digital. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a, it's like so annoying. <laughs> relate to what you're saying about for the last like, I, I can remember as recently as even 10 years ago I would go to conventions and I mean, when I say conventions I would talk I would say these are more like the publishing literary conventions where you'll still have artists attending but it will be more authors and editors and you know agents and 
the the more the word centric crowd more than the mm. uh, visual crowd. But you know, I'll go to these conventions and they'll have panel discussions. And so often there would be these panels where it would be traditional versus digital cover art. Yeah. And the word there is versus. And I and I constantly was telling uh, these convention organizers, either you can have these panels, but take that VS period out of there. Take that versus yeah. out. There's no traditional versus digital unless you're just going to compare um, techniques. But if you're going to uh, try to make it as if this is some sort of uh, – you know, wrestling match and one has to win out over the other. F you. I'm, I'm not interested. Yeah. As, you know, as far back <laughs> as I was working, digital, digital was just as valid. Where you see people really get, you know, bloodthirsty about this is it's collectors who say, well, you know, the digital is ruining the collector market. I don't see it ruining the collector market. Do you? I mean, I see yeah. these originals selling for huge amounts of money. And, you know, and I, I think a lot of the the great digital artists are, you know, have created pretty great revenue streams and, uh, you know, strong careers where they're able to support themselves on merchandising off of their, off of their work. Um, yeah. I, I don't think, I think both of these things, just as I always believe were equally as valid. They were just going to be, they're going to open up different doors from each other. Some, some of those shared and I was okay. Um, I, I've always believed also in addressing the time that you live in. So whereas I really do respect Donato Giancola or Greg Manchus, who are completely traditional, love it. Um, for me, I think I always had a curiosity to say that, well, this computer, the computer matters. And I'm talking like, obviously, 20, 25 years ago, where maybe it wasn't necessarily so embedded into the culture. And I, mm -hmm. and I kind of always thought, well, I always want to get my hands dirty every day, but I still have to address this machine and how we interact with it. So I think I've always had an interest in artists who were hybrids. And I guess yeah. that's where it's gone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I I 100% agree with that because like I I for me again like in, in my work it's always I mean I, I was traditional at first and then um, I, re I actually looked down on digital painting and I thought it was cheating and I didn't you know and I had a, a couple friends that kind of convinced me my dad convinced me you should just try this digital thing and once I finally tried it I I realized immediately like oh wow okay. I can still paint with this. Like I can still, you know, which was, you know, now I do, I do it right on. Do you have a Cintiq? Do you do, like, do you I, still do? I want to hear your, I want to hear your, about your interface. Yeah. Okay. Just real quick. You can keep, I want to hear more about how you work, but like, I, I know for the longest time, whenever I would try these um, digital drawing tools, I never liked the feeling of the plastic on plastic. And that for me, I, I, I'm mm. still, about the drag of that pencil and the drag of the brush and uh, it just it's just what turns me on i mean it's why yeah. every day is that, that 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 element it's not to and deal with photoshop although i still love all the surprises where i'm almost playing tennis with myself when i'm when i'm using the photo elements and the compositing but um but I, I i've never been able to find um sort of a happy place with the digital tools where i felt like it was the same feeling that I had with the traditional. I'm hearing a lot of people though saying that it's getting to where they can't tell. What's your yeah. That? Well, um, the, so for the, for the iPad, uh, that's that's something I've been doing a lot more work on lately. I really enjoy it, and I have like a a um, what do you? I don't know what it's called. It's it's like a it's like, it's like a screen protector, but it's oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a flat um, paper textured. Oh, wow. So when I work, it actually has a slight tooth on it. Okay. And I think you might like that a lot. Um, I don't have that on my Cintiq. I work on a Cintiq for most That's what this is that I'm actually looking at you with. Um, and I do all my digital drawing and painting on this for jobs. Uh, think about the plastic to plastic type thing. Um, I'm, I'm totally in there. Just values, color, yeah. temperature, brushwork. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in that. Like it, I, once I'm working on it, I'm not even thinking about what I'm working on. Um, yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of, you know, I just, feel, I feel, I get lost in it, just like as if I was doing a, a an acrylic or an oil. It's, it's just, it really doesn't feel that much different. And I don't really, I always tell people that I, th I find it in, important for me personally to not abuse the computer. So, 
I mean, of course, there's there's lots of tricks and different things that can help us speed pro- like when we have crazy deadlines. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actual still drawing and painting, mixing your color. There's something to that that gives it that that, that more of an original voice for me. Or, you know, why does my work have a certain look? Well, because I'm still treating it as a painting. I'm yeah. not thinking. I'm not thinking about it in any other way. Right. Um, and what I was gonna say was to relate to the versus thing that you were talking about is <laughs> my agent used to, you know, he would like try to, he would talk to different clients and, and he would say, and this is early on. Um, yeah, Jason, Jason's one of our, our really good Photoshop painters. He kept saying Photoshop painter. And I'm like, can you just not, don't say that. It sounds like Photoshop is doing the work. Right. It's like, I, and the funniest thing about it, I'm, I'm terrible with technology. I'm not um, – I, I, I really couldn't even tell you exactly what kind of computer I have. Um, and as far as Photoshop goes, I basically just use the paintbrush tool and the eraser tool um, and layers. Um, but even then, a lot of times I'll do a lot of my painting on one layer. and People freak out. They're like, oh, why wow. did you do that? I'm like, well, it's because I'm creating a painting. Like I, Or I'll flatten something down. I didn't mean to it. And I'm like, oh, whatever. I'm just painting. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I do think it's important because I kind of – my personal philosophy is I feel like – I feel like struggle is really important. I think it it defines us as far as like in order to do what we do, we've had to struggle through a lot of things to get there. And those struggles are important. And I, I, I feel like – like it's almost like one of the best ways I think about this, something that Jack White said. And he said something like, like one of his favorite guitars to write music on is a piece of crap guitar that it's really generic and it hardly can stay in tune. Uh, and he used to use it to, to write a lot of the White Stripe stuff. The guitar, because it's so difficult to keep in tune and to play, it forces him to, to play the notes in a way to bend it to get to the right place that he wanted to get to. And it, it created a whole sound for him. And without that, he wouldn't have had that sound. He wouldn't have, you know, um, and so. I totally buy that. I, yeah. I, I, and so the struggle kind of helps, you know, helps mold you, uh, gives you that voice. And obviously, none of us like to struggle, you know, but I think it's important, you know, like, I mean, there is, to me, there's never a painting that I do where there's a, there's there, every single painting I do, there's always a point in it where I'm like, mm. Yeah, I don't know, this is – I'm not really liking how this is going, you know, and like you f- kind of feel like starting over or this is not right and you're like – but after a while you realize, no, just keep pushing through it because you're going to figure it out and you're, you're going to get it. It's going to work out. But there is – there's always that thing there that's like, you know, that voice that's kind of like, eh, you suck. <laughs> you know, like, I'll, add I'll add something on top of that. I don't think I can <laughs> – I don't think I can – argue with any of that I'm, I'm i'm totally on board with every bit of that but uh, that bit where you said just now that you're saying uh i'll figure it out i'll get there i'm very confident but i still when i'm in those places i can't i don't ever necessarily feel like i can tell myself i'm gonna get there what i'm always telling myself is i can't stop until i'm happy with this and, and it's not even happy mm-hmm. i've realized in the last couple of years especially when i'm working on the loteria stuff where it's I'm not going to let it go until I surprise myself. And I think what that is, is, you know, different people have a different way of phrasing this, but it's you trying, I don't like to say that I'm trying to top myself because forget that game. It's, it's an up and down game as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> surprise yourself. And, and, and there may be parts of that area or piece or element that I'm working on in this particular illustration where at the end of it all, I feel like I lost where I just, man, I didn't get it. But there is this one part where I did get it. And then you try to build upon that victory for the next piece. Because at some point, you've got to let this stuff go. And God, it's almost like I'm talking to myself about something I'm literally working on right now, where <laughs> people see these things, which may be as soon as this week, when these little bits of stuff come out online. If you don't, if my name isn't attributed to it, nobody will know that it's me. It's so yeah. different from the rest of my stuff, this thing that I'm actually trying to finish off right now. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to do it because of that reason. And you kind of said that talk that you're looking you're always looking for ways that you can push yourself that's why you're doing this sf cover um i had never done anything like this one thing that i'm doing right now where i'm basically creating 
for lack of a better word, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? Almost these little symbols. Um, there's a word that I want to say, but I don't. I don't want to say it because I'll give away. I think what <laughs> for a major book, and there are these symbols that I'm creating that are part of the world building. And you know, I, I know that they're there to promote the book, but I'm not stupid. You know, I've worked on stuff like George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire series, and I know that if this book goes the way I think it does, where it becomes uber popular. Um, it's probably going to have other incarnations into screen or God knows what graphic novels. And these things that I'm creating will be riffed on and will be built upon. So I mm. bet in love with them, you know, and that's, I guess, yeah, I see. Yeah. I bet you're the same way where, you know, you're, you're looking for that place where you fall in love with this thing that you're struggling with, you know, and yeah. our <laughs> love is the reason you're in love with it is because you have to fight so hard to, to kind of get there, and push yourself, you know? I don't know if that even makes sense at the end of all of that, but it's adding Yeah, on. no, it totally does. I mean, I'm actually working on something right now that's exciting but frustrating at the same time. And it's exciting. I can say what it, it this, this this comic that I know, Steve Byrne, he um he just directed his first movie. He did it a couple years ago, but it's coming out at the end of this week. Um and it's it's going to be awesome. He sent me I got to watch it. Um a few times, take notes, sketch from it. And he asked me if I would do a poster for him. Um, but it turned out to be a lot different than I thought at first. I thought we were going to just do a few characters, but we ended up basically, there's 17 characters on this poster. Uh, basically capture, cause there's so many comics that are in this movie. Um, you know, so many, you know, awesome people that are in the movie and we want to show them all. And so I'm doing kind of like a fun, uh, almost like 80 style yeah. um it's academy kind of thing kind kind of but I, uh, <laughs> a little bit but it, it it's it's like main the main star and then like there's like almost it's almost like a collage and what we wanted to do was show draw them from each from all the different characters from certain scenes in the movie because there's a lot of particular parts or this one guy is just in this one part and what is he doing in that scene so so it's kind of a collage in the and the thing is, is I don't have much time to do it. 17 people, full thing. And he loves it, so it's really encouraging. But my stress in this is all the reference that I have to work with are all from completely different light sources. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> None of them go together. Wow. And somehow I have to try to collage these people together. And uh, some ways there's no way to get around it because it's the only reference I have – um, some of it you have to just kind of make things up or add some rim lighting here that affects this other person and they're all kind of, but that's the thing is, is I'm in the middle of it right now where I'm like, Oh, let me just get, there's 17 people. I've got like five blocked in, maybe six. Let's just get through and block them all out. Then I'll come back to it again and start trying to adjust the lighting and try to adjust. So it's at the stage now where, um, all the ingredients are kind of being put in at once but it's not tasting right yet, you know? Yeah, yeah right. It's like, but, yeah. but I know I got it. I know if I just keep going, pushing through that, I will, I will, it will look good when I'm done. Yeah. But I have to just believe enough in myself and know from all the, my past of what I've done and what I know that I'll take care of it. And there's little weird things. Like, there's little things like where something's really, you know, bothering me or whatever. And I'm, I'm sure this happens to you, but like, it's just there's something not right. Yeah. And you walk away, you come back and boom, okay. And you just do this one little thing and ah, oh, there 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 was it. And yeah. now it feels better. You know? that, that happens, but also I think the longer you work and I think you probably know this, you also kind of have to give yourself the permission to throw away something in the 11th hour that you worked so hard on. Mm -hmm. You you just want to give it that one more that one last shot. And it's going to mean sort of divorcing yourself from this work that you've done. I mean, and I'm not saying – actually, I have done this with complete illustrations before where I've literally tossed them out. And, you know, you don't ever – especially if you're working with an art director, you don't want to disregard all the input that that art director has given. Um, so that's not what I'm subscribing to or advocating here at all. You know, you're, you're communicating, but, you know, you basically say, I'm on my own here, but we've got this piece of work. It's pretty much there. It's complete, but I'm going to take one more shot at it. Yeah. And I would say that most of the time when I've done that, you show it to the art director or to the, the client and they're like, yeah, that, that is better. That one is better. Thank God you did that. You know, and I, I'm, <laughs> I'm this one project I'm working on right now where, you know, all the happy noises were coming 
where they're like, this is great. This is awesome. We're there. And in my mind, I'm saying, we're not there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I know. And I'm, it, I'm going to take one more shot. And usually yeah. I don't tell them. I just say, okay, cool. Because you see what they want. And as yeah. long as you lose that bit, now I'm going to go take another shot at it where I think I take us to that place where they can't see it. They don't know this place exists where it's better. That's why they're hiring us, right? To get us to yeah. this place that they can't see. And so that's where I'm trying to go. And now you're the same way, I'm sure. A lot of the guys out there, people out there probably are nodding their heads because they, they well, know. Well, yeah. It's hard. Sometimes you can't sleep at night. You're like, you're like, oh, man, I just can't stop thinking about this. And I've done that plenty of times where I get up. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I got to go work on this for just a little bit because – something's not right and I can't focus <laughs> or like there's times where I'm on a crazy deadline. Um, and I don't know if, have, if you've ever dealt with this, but I'm sure you have, but like basically you have to get this crazy deadline. It's due the next day. Okay. You can either work all through the night, um, or try to go to bed a little early and then get up really early and then just, you know, marathon it until you're done. And so there's, there's times where I've done that, where I'm go, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to bed cause I need, I'm exhausted. And I know I only have till two in the afternoon tomorrow to get this thing done. I'm going to go to bed now. And then you just lay in bed and you're just thinking about the, the, the way the guy's eyes are going to be, or that, you know, you just can't stop thinking about all these different things. And now, then I realize, oh my gosh, I've been laying here for <laughs> two hours painting the painting in my mind and not sleeping like I should be, and the painting is not actually getting done, and now I've, I've just lost two hours that I could have been working or sleeping. And, uh, and sometimes I end up just getting up or, you know, it's it's just, it's, and it's one of those things that I also know that while I'm working on some of these crazy deadlines that I'm thinking, you know what, in six hours from now, it's not going to matter anymore because it's going to be done. Either way, it's going to be done. So just, you know, it's 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 a crazy you know business. <laughs> I've also learned that trick though. Like like I I've made the mistake so many times of fighting and fighting and fighting with something and staying up super super late and then still not getting there and being exhausted the next morning and just being absolutely miserable because you know it's not there. Time is no longer your friend and now you're completely toasted because you you burned your engine so hard. To yeah. Put to something that you thought, you know, I can get there if I just push, keep pushing through it. And I've learned in recent years, cut that out. Stop stop doing that thing where I just sit there and just keep grabbing and grabbing and pulling and pulling. There's a certain point at which it's not happening and you're tired. And I don't care whether it's, you know, five in the, five in the, sometimes I'll do like the thing where I, I cut it down, eat a late dinner, go after it. And then shut it down again and then get, so, okay, like for instance, what I just did last night, I'll take this for an example. I've been working all day on Sunday and put in another stint at night. And I really thought I could get these things done. In fact, I told the client, I think I'm going to have these things done tonight. You'll have them in the, in the inbox in the morning. Came 11 o'clock and I just, I had three elements that just still weren't clicking uh, out of the nine that I had that I thought needed to work. Six of them were good. The other three, I couldn't get it. And I just thought, well, I told them I was going to get it done tonight. But it didn't matter where I really got it done tonight. They're probably in bed already. It was me yeah. that that on me. So I just they said, let's shut it down and let's get up at 3. And that's what I did. Got up at 3 a.m. Yeah. After it, and things clicked. Um, I will say, you do. I've had to learn, just like you, when I, when I say shut it down, I've got to allow myself to just shut it down, you know, and just have the confidence that when I get up, I'll get after it. But then that's always the trick too, right? You're scared that you're not going to get up. <laughs> that's me where I'm like, oh God, okay, please don't let me sleep through this. You know, I've got to, I've got to be able to get up at three in the morning. Do you do, yeah. do you do like uh, set tasks for yourself or like, like what I do is I know, okay, I've got this amount of time to get this thing done. Yeah. I pretty much know, okay, it's going to take me about this much time to paint this and what, you know, so I'll give myself, it's, it's almost like, okay, I'm going to break the rest of my time down on this, 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 and this. So the, the hands in this, they're going to take me a couple hours to do these hands. And I'm giving myself this amount of time. And I'm not going to work on anything but that because I, I, I'm, I'm the kind of painter that I kind of move around the whole piece at once. Um, that's how I just work. But on a crazy deadline, I know that certain elements 
more difficult. And if I can get those things out of the way in a certain amount of time, oh, now I've got four hours left to do the rest of it. And now I feel way less stressed out because now I can focus on that. Um, and I have to kind of just go through like a checklist sometimes. I, I do what I call punch lists, where like I've got punch lists where, and this is more towards the end, but sometimes I'll have these like 20 or 30 something item long punch lists of all these areas in the piece where it's just like, mm. that sucks, that sucks. And usually these, these various <laughs> proofs that I'll print out for myself, some of them really nice, some of them really crappy, and it'll just be all these huge red marks and just like sucks, sucks, sucks. And I'll write <laughs> in the moment of like, okay, I think this might work, try this, you know? And so yeah, I mean, I, I, I punch list on every job, no matter how big or small. Uh, I'll always be punch listing because, you know, and, and that's usually the way to kind of, um, I, I will say that the sooner I start punch listing or forcing myself to punch list, um, the fast, the sooner, it, the more efficient it makes me. I find that when I sort of really work, 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 and then save that punch listing element for right towards the end of the deadline, doesn't really work so well. So I, I, I think the earlier I start forcing myself to sort of almost uh, having that punch list, it's almost like you're telling yourself, this is it. This is your final decision set. Yeah. And now you're just going to tweak that final decision set. You know, you're working on much tighter deadlines, I think, regularly than I am. But, uh, but yeah, I, that's, that's kind of how I do. When I do what you do, where you kind of slot, okay, I'm going to do two hours on this, two hours on that. You know what I end up doing? I end up like, running overtime on that one element that I said I was going to work this much. So I end up trying to see if I can make up that time on this other one. And it just yeah. plays out for me. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that, that, that can be the, you know, the nail in the coffin too, because that's happened to me before as well. But I kind of just give myself, you know, a certain amount of time and I'm like, Hey, or I'll put on like a podcast that's like an yeah. hour long. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen. By the time this podcast is done, I got to be done with this section. And so, you know, it, it tends to help me out. Yeah, you know? I do the soundtracks, right? You know, you know exactly how long it is and say, okay, we're going to get this section done by the time this one's done. So that that actually yeah. that actually is probably more successful now I think of it than where I just say, <laughs> this set of time. It's, it's almost like you've got the music to kind of meter you or almost yeah. like as a metronome. Time management is a huge, a huge factor, you know. So that's, yeah, time management is one of those things where I, that's something that, you know, you have to, the only way you're going to understand that and get through it is by experiencing, you know, there's so many ups and downs in the business of illustration and just art in general. Like when you start, I mean, it's one thing to be an artist, uh, you know, even like a hobbyist, like I love to do, you know, to draw and paint. But when it, when it comes to like, Hey, you're now you're, you're painting for somebody else. It's, this is another project. All the, it's, it's so interesting to me, all the different elements that come into play that sometimes when I talk to people who don't do this, like family members, they ask, like, you know, how are things going? And uh, I'm one of those people that when they say, hey, how's it going? I don't just go, oh, good. I actually tell people, well, oh, yeah. I'm actually kind of stressed out right now. <laughs> and like, and I start talking about what I'm working on. I'm like, well, that sounds terrible. <laughs> like, well, it's not terrible. It's just I, I can't focus on anything else right now until this thing is done. Like, um, so it's 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 funny because it is it, it's one reason why I like to do this podcast because I like to be able to talk with other artists that you know you get it like this is like you know not many people understand um, that aspect of you know the business I mean because there's so many um, things that can happen and come up while you're working on a project and even now today today like I you know like you were you were talking. What I was going to say is even now today, like certain things will still come up that have never happened to me before. I'm like, oh, that's a new one. Yeah. But like you were talking earlier about, uh, you know, w working with like art directors and editors and things like that. And I learned early on that, you know, when an art director is excited about something and he likes it and everything else and we're, we're putting a lot of time in, I've learned now to be like, hey, has the editor seen this? Does, does the <laughs> editor like this? Because there's been so many times – <laughs> um, where I'm working on this thing and the art director loves it and they're, oh, this is going to be great. And then I spent so much time, it's almost even finished. And then they're like, oh, yeah, the editor, it's not anything like what we want. I'm like, oh, so those are just things you learn along the way where you yeah. just you're like, yeah. has the editor's wife seen it? Has, <laughs> has his grandma seen it? Like, 
Yeah. How many more questions? Did he have oatmeal today? Does he feel okay? Like, because uh, it, it, it can be crazy uh, sometimes. Um, I have a funny story for you. Um, I For years, I worked for the New York Observer. I did a lot of uh, – I don't even know how many. I did a lot. There was a period where I was doing a cover almost every week or every other week for them. Uh, so I did a ton of work for them. I had no idea – that the editor was Jared Kushner. Oh wow! No, no, I, no idea. Oh boy! And uh, boy. and the funny thing was, so I was, you know, we we d- didn't really do anything having to do with Trump ever. Um, but I did a lot of, you know, they they seemed to be, um, they didn't really seem to be like right wing or left wing. They kind of seemed to be like right in the middle and kind of, they kind of um. You know, I, one week I would be making fun of Sarah Palin on a cover, and the next week it would be Obama or something. It was like back and forth, and it was fun. It yeah. was kind of like a mini Saturday Night Live page or something. Uh, How long ago was this? Uh, well, I stopped working with them maybe three, four years ago. They they kind of stopped. Uh, yeah, they kind of stopped. They're, 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 I think they think they just went online, but okay. they stopped really hiring artists. Um, uh, but it was about eight or more years maybe eight or nine years that i worked for them that i did i did lots of covers yeah and so during during just before trump when trump was like um basically running for president i didn't think that he was going to be the nominee and um i was in i was enjoying the the debates and the the republican debates you know he'd just be like Shut up, Jeb. You're a poopoo poo face. Okay, you are a poopoo poo face. Yeah. Lang Ted, Lang Ted. You know, he was just doing all that stuff the whole time. Yeah. And I just thought this is hilarious. Like, this is, you know, it's not hilarious now, but at the time I thought it was funny. So I was doing all these little, little cartoons and caricature ideas, like, like that I thought would be fun pitches. Like, like Trump would say some crazy thing, and then I would do a doodle, and I would send it in to, to the observer. Like, you know, because I'm the kind of person that like I like to remind my clients, hey, I'm still here because yeah. sometimes and, and then like if I can be ahead of a story and like, oh, we'll hire you for next week. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to do. And finally, the art director wrote me and said, hey, I don't know. To, to, how, I just want to say this. Um, Jared Kushner is the editor here and we're never going to do any of these Trump ideas. Uh, they 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 no one here is gonna like those or print those. And I was like, what? Like I had no idea this entire time. Like for, I had no idea, and it was just crazy. Like how did I not even you know? Because they kept they kept they kept they kept saying like no to me over and over again. I'm like, how do they not like th- this? Is a funny idea. Like this would, and I kept thinking this would be a great cover. It's so funny. I had no idea. And then um, the funny thing is, is then that art director went uh, like. Like man, I don't know. It was pretty pretty soon after that conversation, he sent me a a fun text, and it was a a photo of a cover I did of Trump, um, one of my first covers ever, and it was like from two thousand three or two thousand four or something, yeah. and it was Trump sitting on a it, oh, and it's just god awful. Like I didn't know what I was doing, and it was like, it was like um, I did it in acrylics color pencil pen and ink i mean I, every medium like i just whatever would make them what i needed you know and it was trump sitting on a on a throne with a the, this the pentagram behind it and he had horns coming out of his head and he's got hooves for feet and he's going like you're like you're fired and then there's like these two little cupids on the ground like oh like that um and it's just terrible it, it was bad cover but he sends me a picture of that cover in Oh, and it, this is something else I left out. It was for a religious satire magazine called The Door. Nice. Um, and I think they're from Texas, actually. But um, he sent a of my cover that I hadn't seen in so many years in a gold frame. Oh, boy. And it, looked, it was, like, really nice looking, like, the way it was framed. And, I, and he goes, you're never going to guess where this is hanging. And I was like, where? He's like, uh, in Trump's uh, golf club. I'm, I'm hanging out in the in the – Whatever golf club it was, because he was there with Kushner and stuff. 
<laughs> I'm like, Trump has my painting of him as the devil framed hanging in his golf club. So weird, man. Like, that's like crazy. such a <laughs> – well, you know what's, what's another thing that's funny about it is what, what, what makes me laugh about this whole thing is I had done another cover of Trump years ago where – I think around 2010 – um, where I have him tied to the to his own building, like tied to the stake, and he's being burned at the stake at his own building, and it said, and the it was for the Utney Reader, and it says "Fire the Rich," and he's just on the cover going like, Ugh, like that, and like, and there's like flames coming up and all this, and a friend of mine, um, who's in a, a well known band, his girlfriend at the time, like hung out with uh, Ivanka. Mm. Wow. Um, at some event or whatever. I don't know if it was a concert that they played or whatever. And then she said, oh, my, a friend of mine just painted your dad on, on covers. So she showed her the, you know, the painting. And she, she goes, oh, he hates that. Like, <laughs> he, she's, she's like, he saw that. He was, he was, he's not happy about that. She was, and I, so I got this message from my friend. It's like, Trump like, I really hated your painting. So I think it's really funny that he hated that one. <laughs> but he's got the other one of him as a devil framed and hanging. Do you think he's made the connection? It's the same artist. I, I'm I don't doubting it. <laughs> I don't think he's. I don't think he reads the. <laughs> I goes in there and he's like, like illustrated by. Yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think he does. <laughs> I just love that. That that's um, awesome. yeah. That's true. It's, that's the fun thing about this. The kind of like in my line of work, it's. I mean, I'm sure it's. It's different because it's different than what you do in this way where I know when I'm doing a cover, like I did, I painted Nancy Pelosi a couple weeks ago and it was a fun, silly cover. And it's, it's kind of sort of a, a buzz. It gives you a buzz or like a high while you're working on it. Cause you know, she's going to see it. <laughs> exactly. And so it's, and it's, and it's funny, like I don't hate her or anything like that, but it, it's, 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 she's a, she's a politician. It's fair game as far as I'm concerned. And it's fun, and so when you're painting it, you're, I'm thinking this is this is gonna. I, I wish I was there to see it, see, to that, see her reaction. That's, <laughs> that, that's like really important stuff there. I mean, I mean this from this standpoint, understanding what your buttons are and where your buttons are. Like, yeah. like that that joy of the the subject of the piece seeing it or potentially seeing it. You know that that thing that turns you on and, and understanding it and embracing it. It's a, it's a really important thing to realize. And I find that there's a, it's amazing how many. I want you to just say illustrators, just people who don't really know where their buttons are. Like for me, I, I I still sometimes get this thing of like, you know, why don't you do more gallery shows? And I, and I my answer is always, well, gallery shows will come when they come, and and some already have. But I think what people mean when they ask it, because it's usually people who are outside of the illustration world who say. You know, they, they almost think that to be a successful professional artist, you've got to have this big gallery presence. And I just never. Mm, yeah. And the reason was it's because early on, I understood that a lot of what kind of got me off or what my button was, was it was seeing those covers in a competitive marketplace and always thinking that this thing's going to have to be amongst a bunch of other book covers. Now, I know bookstores are not so much. You know, we don't see as many physical bookstores anymore, but they still exist. And there's still yeah. a, a massive digital marketplace where thumbnails matter on, on an Amazon website or on a Barnes & Noble website. And so your your stuff is being judged against lots of other stuff by the consumers. And I, I always got off on that. And I still do. I kind of enjoy yeah. that process of being that my thing's going to be judged by all these strangers and all these people. That's, what, that's part of it, what's exciting about that. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Feel like. For me, like this book comes out tomorrow and I'm hoping that it helps to sell this book. I'm not going to get a cent out of this, the sales of this, if it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I got paid for the job, but yeah. that thing of, it's not even so much of an ego trip as much as, as far as saying like, I did this. I mean, there is that element, but it's really that competitive element of seeing the thing, having to compete in the marketplace and usually succeed, sometimes fail and learning from those failures and saying, why, why didn't that work? Well, I made some decisions there that I'm going to have to learn from for next time, but I still get off on that. So like yeah. that, you were saying about like, you can't wait to hopefully find out, you know, how these people feel about this piece or. Uh, I wish I had a camera. I wish there was yeah. some way. Exactly. Like I, I, when Obama was president, I mean, I painted him so many times yeah. and yeah. you know, there's so many times I was like, oh, I know, I know he's going to see this. I know for a fact, it's going to see this. And I just, I just imagine him being like, 
Oh, Siler. <laughs> Mich Michelle, Michelle, hey, come here. Yeah. Look, look at this one. <laughs> he has me. He has got me smoking again. You know. <laughs> um, but like, it's just I. I just think it's just fun. You know, it's yeah. just fun. That's it's a fun thing to be able to work in a way, or like you, you know, whenever you get that opportunity, to work on a, a project like. Um, you know, like with your book covers, I mean, like you said, like, it's such a cool thing, you know, it's, it's something, and I think from what you just said too, like you relate to it. I never get tired of that. You know, that's, it's, it's so exciting to be, I feel so honored and lucky that I've gotten to do the, those kind of things, but it does, for me, it doesn't go away. Like I'm still, I still can't wait for the next thing. Um, cause it's the whole point. The whole point is like, you know, you, your art is being, uh, used to help, uh, make a product better um, or, or just more interesting or whatever it is. But the fact that you're a part of that creative yeah. process it's there is to exciting. Tell a story, right? It's always, it's there to tell a story. Yeah. With, and it's there to tell a story from a number of different levels, from that gut level where somebody sees that thing and they have no idea what this thing's about, but your thing is communicating some level of story, even if it's um, yeah. at a thumbnail level or at, at a gut level. Um, and then there's how they look at the cover art after they've read the book and they look hopefully at it in a different way. Or, you know, it's like you're, you're hopefully your piece is opening doors at different levels of the experience. Um, I think I'll add one, one other thing to this. And I'm finding more and more that I don't control sometimes how a cover or a piece of art ends up shaping things that they weren't even intended for. So, like, for instance, when I did the Song of Ice and Fire calendar, um, so those, for, for people who may not know, th those are the books written by George R. R. Martin that became the show called Game of Thrones on HBO, which I think yeah. most people don't know what that is, even if they yeah. never see it. So I did this. No, 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 no. Exactly. <laughs> Forever and ever. I, I, I did those pieces before there was a show. Uh, in fact, the show was in production while I was doing these pieces that were based off the books. Because, again, there is no show. Um, George had told me that HBO had bought the rights for this. But he said, as they're casting for it, don't look at what they're doing in Entertainment Weekly or in the media. I want a John Picasso vision of my book characters. That was literally the quote. And I mean, cool. what, what better thing can you hear than that, right? I want your vision of my stuff un unadulterated by anything else. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I embraced that wholeheartedly. Well, it took about a year, I guess, to get all of that work done. And by the time I was done, the show was coming out. And so my stuff had been turned in. I think, in fact, it had already had it already been released. I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the timing, but basically my point is, is my work had been finished before the show existed on screen. And so I hadn't seen what the actors look like. But then when that first episode comes, I don't know if you're familiar or for people out there who are not familiar with it. There is this scene in the first episode where you have these this family called the Starks and they're lined up outside or inside of their castle, which is called Winterfell. And you have this family. Uh, called the, the Baratheons, who were coming into the, uh, into the gates. And so um, the POV is looking at the Baratheons coming in, and then they shift the POV, and you go down the line of the Starks as they're waiting to sort of receive the Baratheons. And as they're going down the line of Starks, I'm like, that guy just looks just like my artwork. She looks just like my artwork. And there, not everybody looked like my stuff, but there were at least three prominent characters where I'm like, Look at my wife saying, oh, my God, it looks just like my stuff. <laughs> really excited, just kind of giddy about it. It was like, wow, yeah. cool, you know? And then, you know, as time went along, I realized, oh, there's some other things that look like my stuff. And uh, George and I were friends at that point, but I never brought it up with him. So a couple of years later, just to wrap this up, I'm at this convention called Worldcon, and it was in London that year. And the producers for Game of Thrones were there. And um, long story short is they basically told me, yeah, we were looking at your stuff the entire time because as you were doing it, it was being fed to us. And so we actually used some of your stuff to base some of the casting decisions for the show. I had no idea. That's awesome. That's <laughs> so, so cool. The point is that sometimes we're doing these things, we don't even know the kind of lives that they're going to have beyond the one project we're doing it for. And that's yeah. just an added byproduct of this job that we have. It's, it's, it's it is so a awesome, man. A lot I got I got a funny, a fun, similar, weird thing that I think you'll get a kick out of. I'll try to keep it real short, but uh, years ago, I got to work on Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland with Bobby Chu, oh, yeah. and um, he 
he was like, hey, I'm working on this movie. Would you like to help work on some of the characters? I was like, sure. So he uh, sent me some rough doodles that he had done and also that Tim Burton had done. And I started working on Tweedles. Um, just I, I only worked on, like I think, two paintings of it. And um, my first take was to make him look kind of like Hansel and Gretel. Like, like I thought that'd be kind of an interesting take, like these, you know, like just like like little buckles on their boots and the different, you know, just that kind of clothing style. So that was my first approach. But as I we started doing the painting, we uh, it developed and we changed a few things, added the classic Tim Burton striped T-shirt, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I had I went I went to lunch, I took my little girl uh, to a park, and as I, as we're at the park playing, there was these little kids that came up and were talking to her. And they had, they were like very, very almost transparent skin. Mm. Like I could see all these veins yeah, yeah. just going through on the side of their heads. And it was like, it was just so distracting. But it was like, I was like, man, that, that's a, I'm going to add that to the my Tweedle thing. Because that would be kind of interesting. So I went back to my studio, basically removed the eyebrows because these kids barely had eyebrows. And then I just added these like blue veins and made that skin feel transparent. And it was just a very subtle, simple thing. This was like a concept. It wasn't like a super, super detailed thing. But then when the – like months and months later when the trailer comes out and I see the Tweedles for the first time, they're my Tweedles. Yeah. What, me, what me and Bobby worked on is like exactly – it was like, whoa, that's so cool. And yeah. then they show a close-up and I was like, no way. The, the veins, the blue veins and I'm like – that's those those kids have no idea that their veins are on in that movie because if I was if I didn't see that I wouldn't have thought of that for that particular thing it just but it's just kind of interesting how those things happen and like you said like I got such a kick out of that little thing of <laughs> those veins and every time I see that movie I'm like that's so weird it's just like it's it's a cool thing and it's I mean it's trippy already that t- to be able to work on something cool like that yeah but um just knowing like that's my little secret like yeah. it was, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty exactly. cool. That's fun. Yeah, I wanted to um, ask you something real quick. Bef- uh, it, you you said something about comic books and and um, how you were doing like I don't know if it was comic covers or whatever before or like the transition from that to books. Yeah. yeah. So you weren't like doing it was it was it your own personal comic work or was it oh, okay that's what it was okay because yeah. I wanted to know like how the transition from that to getting your first book cover. Um, was it just, you know, basically like what you said, like someone saw, saw that personal work of yours and said, Hey, I think you'd be great at doing a book cover. And then from there on, you were just like, I like this book cover thing. And you just kept going full speed with that. Is that kind of, Jesus, I'm just gonna have to fill in. Cause you just, you just nailed it. I mean, you okay. It. I was just curious because you got yeah. the painting in one. <laughs> Good job. Man. Nice job. Now you nailed it. That's pretty much it. I mean, um, yeah, it, it's luck. You know, why am I here? It honestly was luck. I, I didn't, I didn't in 19, was this 1996, I guess. I, I didn't look at myself as a book cover artist. I didn't look at myself as a science fiction fantasy artist. I looked at myself as somebody who was by day working as an intern architect doing um, residential architecture, hoping to design homes for people who were way too rich and did not deserve homes this nice because they had <laughs> Uh, uh, I think we did a home for, um, remember that guy went to prison, that guy, uh, actually, you know what? I'll just leave that alone. (laughs) 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 But yeah, basically they they were, they were so nice that we only had to do two or three a year because they were, had such huge budgets. It was Mm. fun, but I I wouldn't say it was fulfilling. I, I kind of always knew, even when I was in architecture school that I liked architecture, but I loved illustration. And so I was getting my degree in architecture, um, but I kind of knew that my, my life was not going to be about architecture, at least not completely. So at that point, I'm working as an intern architect, but I, um, I always wanted to do my own comics. So I was self-publishing my own stuff. It was, it was a book called Words and Pictures. Um, stuff was pretty horrible. It was black and white, um, but it was just me sort of doing my own slice of life stories, uh, pen and ink. In fact, it was Ballpoint and Sumi Ink Brush. I would say at that time, it's very influenced by Vertigo, the DC Vertigo law. Mm, yeah. And um, I was loving stuff by Dave McKean, George Pratt, John Muth, Kent Williams, that whole era of very painterly uh, storytellers. 
and you know, of course Neil Gaiman's Sandman and uh, yeah. Jamie Delano on Hellblazer. And, you know, all that stuff was really a big influence on me. And you can tell, I mean, you literally look at that book first glance and you can tell, oh yeah, that guy was so horny and vertigo. It's not even funny. But, you know, it was me learning how to tell my own stories in a sequential form and having grown up loving the medium. Well, this was me actually, you know, stretching my muscles and building muscles doing it. I only had a couple of issues under my belt. And I was writing and drawing half of the book. And a friend of mine at the time was writing and drawing his own stories in the other half. So it was a really good training ground. And yeah, I was the one doing the covers. And the covers look nothing like what I do now. They're very photo driven because I didn't have confidence in my drawing ability at that time. I was still very much relying on photographic collage. Um, it was very, you know, my, my skills were very embryonic. So um, a publisher called Mojo Press happened to see these books. Because at that time, even as an, in a small little tiny indie publisher, um, our stuff was getting distributed to a lot of the big comic stores across the country. Um, I don't know if that can happen anymore. I guess it can. Um, you can get mm. put into those catalogs, those previews catalogs. But I don't know. If comic stores will buy, take a chance on you like they were back then. But anyway, our stuff was out there. This publisher saw it and said, hey, would you be interested in doing a, a book cover for the science fiction book? And I was like, well, tell me a little about it. And they told me, and I said, you know, I'd rather just keep doing my comics. I mean, how stupid was I? I mean, seriously, <laughs> I, I literally turned them down on the first one. And they said, well, why wouldn't you want to do this? What would make you want to do it? And I was like, well, who's doing the um, the typesetting? Who's doing the, the, the title masthead? I called it a masthead at that time. Who's doing the book the book flap layouts and who's doing you know all of the various jobs besides what I'm doing and they say like, why do you want to know and I say well because I kind of want to do them and they said why and I was like and this is a totally arrogant early twenty something answer but I did say it I said well if I can build a house why can't I build a book so stupid I mean that's yeah. so arrogant but I think I will I'm sharing <laughs> that both to show my own stupidity and show how luck just happened to kind of go my way and that um I, but also there was, I think I've always been curious I've always been someone who's always been very curious about process and trying to understand how my job works within the greater flow of the thing mm. I think I'm still that way um but anyway I, I did all of it and um I fell in love is what it comes down to I fell in love not just with doing the cover but the whole process of how book covers and books are made and and Mike Morcock, who I've mentioned a couple times in this talk, he's a huge he was and is a huge influence on me in terms of how I try to carry myself as a professional and how I try to think, um, how I try to be as a as an activist, even someone who tries to work within the world and work for the world. Um, Mike's still that guy. Um, so anyway, uh, it had a huge influence and it made me say, I want to do this. So I never have gone back to comics and I never have yeah. missed. I still love the medium. Um, I understand a lot more about that business now, even though I haven't been in it. I have a lot of friends who are, and I think I did make the right choice. I, I'm happy to be working in books, but I have a feeling before I'm done, there's going to be some comics work ahead of me still. Um, yeah. Still love the medium. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's what's awesome about what you can do or what you do. Um, what you do do uh, <laughs> is that, you know, it, you're, you've got the ability to, you could go either way. I mean, you could, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think, I think I, I was really interested in doing covers for comic books at, at a certain period of time as well. Yeah. Um, and I did a few for myself just to, you know, to have in a portfolio. Um, but then I, I just wasn't happy with the industry. I got offered a couple things eventually. And I was like, that's, they honestly just weren't paying enough. It yeah. was like ridiculous. And I was like, yeah. This is like in, it's kind of insulting, actually, and uh, it is. <laughs> and I just lost my interest really quick. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so, you know, so that it was like a wake up call because I was going, I was doing illustration editorial work, and then all of a sudden I get this opportunity to do something for a, a big comic company where I'm like, oh, this is I, I've been wanting to do this since I was a little kid, and then they quoted me like 400 bucks or something for a cover, and I was like. Yeah. No. And then I had people like, you turn that down. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's like, it's, and, and also I know me, like it, I know how much time and work I would have put into it. And I, it would have been like less than minimum wage. It would yeah. have been like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so that, I, that's how I lost my interest. But my, my point is, is, is like, I think 
what's cool about what you do is that your style and your 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 techniques and like your ability to compose these images you could can do anything like you can do book covers you can do illustration you can do you know posters and you know you'd be great at doing i'm sure have you ever have you ever done movie posters oh i so badly want to because you you definitely i mean that that's a no-brainer right there (laughs) boy i tell you what i'm about to do though i'm about to work on a pitch for a children's book never done before that's cool yeah that's a direction that i i kind of i wrote an outline for something and then i picked um a writing partner or an author it's it's an author friend and she's a she's a huge mega name she wasn't a mega name when we first met but um we just always enjoyed each other's people um she's always been a good friend um but she's a she's a monster now i mean she's a mega superstar and and that wasn't why i picked her i just picked her because i enjoyed talking to her and i and loteria this thing that i've talked about earlier you know it's this thing where it's a a series of illustrations based off of a Mexican um, game of chance, uh, mm-hmm. it's like bingo. And and I wanted to create my own icons based off of what the original icons were that have been around for you know a couple centuries. And um, I realized as I was doing those pieces, I was also creating little stories in my head like lullabies. So I started writing that stuff down. And that's an ongoing project that'll eventually be a book. But as I was doing it, I was finding that to be a pretty lonely process. And mm-hmm. so I had another idea for a children's book, and I thought, this one I can't do by myself, not because I'm not capable of it, but because I don't want to have two lonely projects working on at the same time while I'm trying to do my <laughs> professional work. So I asked her to work on it with me. And so that this, this week and this next week after, next two weeks, I'm going to be trying to develop the pitch for this thing. And, you know, it's, a, it's another, it's going to be another frontier to try to, you know. Yeah, that's, cr- that's awesome, though. Before. And how do my skills that I have now you know, address the problem solving that's required for that children's book. It's going to mean me having to stretch those skills and do things that I haven't done. So I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it's taken me a while to kind of get my confidence up to do it because it is going to take some some growth that, you know, it's not going to be just me being able to lay, play on the same uh, routines that I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's the next thing. So but that's, I think that's part of that's part of the the joy of doing this kind of work, though, is is that you know, it basically those kind of challenges, I think, are what make it exciting because it's problem solving, you know, like yeah. that's part. I mean, that's a lot of what we do, I think, is problem solving, like especially, you know, you get all the the, the, dead, the deadlines and all these elements need to be put in here to tell this story. Yeah, but what about this? Like, that's another thing that comes into play, like what you're talking about with the text and the type and the, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, that's a problem. That can be a, a huge problem with how you're going to lay things out. And um, it's funny that when you mentioned that, it, it reminded me that I did the same thing that you said. Like, you know, not I can build a house. I can't build a house. Um, but there, there's been magazines in the past where, you know, sometimes they'll they'll take like your character and they'll cut around the character and put the type behind it. And so that's happened before where it always looks terrible. Like, and I, and so there's been clients where I'm, I just request, like, could you send me, just send me the cover and I'm going to paint everything into the cover. And right. they're like, Oh, we can't do that because I'm like, just send me the main thing and I'll, or just, you know, send it, you know, send me the layer and I'll just, I'll show you what I'm talking about. And then that way I can work with the characters and make it really flow. So I know how it's going to go with the, the, the title and, um, and that's happened before a few times, and it's it's. I, I try to request that as much as possible, actually. Yeah. Um, with like the, you know, like even Time Magazine, I've had them send me like, I, can you just send me like your actual layout, so that I can move my character around and play with it more, yeah. and because I'm, it because a lot of times you just do a painting, and you send them the painting, and then they do that. Right. But what if? I get to do it. It maybe it gives me a, a different idea that I wouldn't have thought of before, and I can make it, you know, flow. Like when I did uh, the Pope for Time Magazine, one of the things I did was, it's a real basic art thing, but Time Magazine's got that red border. Yeah. So, I purposely was thinking about that red border the whole time. So I did like this greenish background because it was gonna pop. Yeah. And then the Pope has like this cream, like white outline and he just pops out. Yeah. And so 
I think that's really important when you're working on this kind of stuff. To it, like when you said that, I was like, oh man, that's totally. I I don't think that's crazy at all because like it can totally ruin the art yeah. if the type is crazy and not and and not, and here's the thing, I am not a graphic designer. Um, I am not good with type. There's like there's certain clients that they want me to do type on certain things that's happened before. I'm like, no, 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 no. I just draw and paint things. Like I don't feel comfortable with that. Like I don't even have a good font selection. Like I have no idea. Um, that's not, that's not what I do, but, uh, that stresses me out when that happens. (laughs) That's happened a few times. But I think you're right. I think when you're able to think about all, when you're able to have those situations where all the elements are available to you to kind of see how the whole, composition of the cover works typographically yeah it's not always the case but yeah I, th- I can see that in the editorial world where you know there are just certain templates that they're basically using and of course you have the same masthead and the more you know about that stuff it does inform your decisions and in the, and especially if you're able to then incorporate those into the work on your own it makes for a much more cohesive solution i've always believed that for a lot of those yeah. covers i did back in my early days I would insist on doing the design myself, where I would design the cover. I wouldn't design the entire book like I did on that first job, but I would design the entire jacket, including down to the end flaps, you know, and just work it all out and turn it in. And I found, I still find, even though I hate, you know, I find, I don't know what, if you're the same way, I find it, as I get further and further from pieces that I did 10, 12, 15 years ago, I find that there's very few of them that I can stomach looking at. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that. I still look back in a lot of those layouts they are good. They're strong because at least the, the elements work together. Even if I hate the art, and it's it's just not up to snuff anymore to what I would hope my, my stuff could be. But the, the layouts still work because everything was thought through at the same time as opposed yeah. to one was an afterthought. You know? Yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah, I have a hard time looking at stuff I did a couple months ago. Like, <laughs> like I, I get, yeah, especially when when you're doing quick deadlines and you know, I'll feel proud of it, and then I'll look back. I'm like, oh, I know. Like, if I had a little bit more time, like even that cover you were talking about that I did with with all the the COVID people. Yeah, that was so. There's there's hardly any time to think. It's yeah. just get it done really quick. Yeah, yeah. But um, the other thing I was gonna say is, like, with magazine cover stuff, I don't. It's it's not really like this with book covers, but I'm sure with back of the books maybe. But there's that barcode code. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, guess what? There's basically you've got this weird L shape that you have to work in. So everything has to work in this L shape. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> that changes everything. Or yeah. It's just it's just funny how, you know, those are things like when I when I was first getting interested in starting to in illustration, that those are things that never even crossed my mind. You know, like I just was like, oh, I love this artist and that artist, and I want to do what they're doing. I want to, I want to be an illustrator, and I never even thought about those things. I never thought about, you know, the flow of their image, and and I would even be judgmental. I would see a cover and be like, oh, I bet you I could do better than that, not realizing, oh, they only had a couple days, <laughs> and they had to work with all these other elements and all these different things, and and uh, but it's just it's just it's interesting looking back now at, at my younger self and. And just knowing how wrong I was about a lot of things, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when you're working on books for like, and I, I think a lot of the artists out there who do book covers right now, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you work on books for authors that are very, you know, that are bestsellers or they're huge names, well, their their names usually are huge on the, you know, they, they take up a huge amount of real estate. Yeah. So that means your art is going to tend to be very sort of compacted. So you almost know going in that you've got to really think about almost a a very tight proportional window that you're going to have to almost target within and think about how your composition is going to work within that. Even if your art director is not saying it, you kind of know it that, you know, when it's this guy, I don't know, John Martin or, you know, somebody who's huge, you, you know right away, well, that's going to take up a lot of space. So I better not think of something that's going to have this huge full bleed thing that you're going to have to see all these parts of it uh, yeah. and for it to be legible and understandable. I know that I've basically got this sweet spot right here, and that's where my story has to be able to be told. And that's it. And that's yeah. part of the challenge, man. It's kind of part of the... the and then there's those times, I don't, I don't know if this happens with book covers, but then there's those times where, you know, like, oh, I just spent like, like 34 minutes 
painting this like little detail on this thing, and then I see it in print, and there's a word over it, the whole thing. <laughs> and it's like, why did, I, that guy doesn't even need to be wearing a satchel. Like what? Like that's happened before too. I'm like, what was? So it, it teaches you how to simplify certain things too, yeah. because yeah. you know. But that's one thing that, um, man, that that's that's one of the things that sometimes it's out of your control. Yeah. You know, like they'll because they don't even know sometimes like what text or how they're going to do it. Right. Um, it's it's definitely one of those things where, um, there there's certain times where I'll see something in print, and it's it it actually enhances it it just it, it comes together and makes it really cool it's like oh this is like this looks great this is awesome and then there's other times where you're just like eh, i'm not going to share that one <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah, right yeah yeah, I, yeah it's it's crazy i did one um a couple years ago movies unlimited i think is what it was called and it was like this catalog for t just thousands of movies and uh, they wanted me to do a, a fun caricature cover and basically they just listed all these people they wanted me to paint. And so it was kind of like a collage of all these – like Jack Nicholson from The Shining and uh, Rambo and um, Caddyshack and just different – you know, Audrey Hepburn and whatever. All these different characters all – and it was just a fun kind of a cover. And I – and they, they showed me the logo. It was really cool. It looked like one of those like movie marquee type things with the light little light bulbs. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun, cool thing. I'm like, this is a fun project. And then I saw the printed version. Oh my god! Like they colored my background. Oh man! Like I did like a white background with the characters, and they just popped up. They did it like this weird teal color, oh and and uh, the values matched some of the values in my painting, and it just looked. It, it just. It was one of the worst things. Oh. I couldn't even. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that, every once in a while, that kind of stuff. But I don't think. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't really see that happening as much in the book industry. They, it seems like it's a lot more carefully planned. I would say that, <laughs> well, in the small press world, I definitely see where some of those train wrecks happen. Where you know they're, they're just okay. people who are working on stuff and they're maybe working on it part time. You know, it's, it, or you know, they they don't really have the skills. Or they just want to do the job. Uh, back in the day, that is kind of why I decided to be as you were very insistent upon. Let, let me go ahead and do the, the design because I figured I'm probably just – if anybody's going to make the mistakes, why don't I just go ahead and just be me making mistakes? <laughs> uh, I, and Not that I was going to be better, but I just kind of trusted myself to go ahead and just yeah. keep going until I thought that we had something that would make us all happy. But I would <laughs> say working with those big five publishers, um, you know, when I say big five too, I mean like the Random Houses, the Simon Schusters, they, they, they tend to – have people who are on staff who this is what they do and yeah you know, they're gonna be i would imagine yeah <laughs> and know what they're doing this like for instance this cover that comes out tomorrow for black sun i mean when people see the cover and a lot of people like i know have already been you know going crazy about it the piece of art that's on there it was not cropped the way they cropped it i mean it's basically like half the art is cropped off the cover that's oh wow yeah i was thinking about it being presented when i first gave it to him i thought it was going to be very sort of in the middle of the pocket, you know, with all the big type around it and just sitting right there and centered up in the middle, very iconic. And that was not the way it turned out. Um, and why did they do that? Well, you know, nobody ever told me why they did it that way, but I, I figured out pretty quickly um, that a lot of the vibe I was getting early, part of, part of why they liked what I did is that it was speaking to this book as a major fantasy book but it was also a piece of art that was reading as more modern than what a lot of typical fantasy art is. And mm. the thing, a conversation happening at the time that I wasn't even aware of, where a lot of um, women fant or female fantasy authors were feeling very strongly that the packaging on fantasy books written by females was always kind of tending towards very romantic and softer and not treated as, um, how do I say this? they were not getting equal treatment in how they were being presented with how men were being presented as authors in terms mm. of equal treatment. And so even though I wasn't privy to that whole conversation that was happening online, my artwork, I guess unwittingly, tapped into that and was being read as sort of gender neutral. Let's just put it that way. That's oh, okay. Kind of told to me by somebody who was an observer of the field, not somebody within the company. 
But I also understood that the editor that was working on the book uh, was looking for things that didn't necessarily read as typical fantasy fare. He wanted things that could sort of straddle between literary and fantasy. I knew that. Um, and so when I saw the way that the type was laid out for Black Sun, people can go look at it now online, I'm sure. Uh, it's it's very oddly cropped, but I loved it right away, I must say. I thought that the the designers did a great job with it. And even though it wasn't the way I envisioned my art being presented, um, I thought it, it, it made sense to me. And obviously from the reaction the way it's been online, I think they made the right call. Um, so yeah, sometimes you get surprised in the in a in a good way, but yeah, I've been there too, where yeah, it's not such a good surprise. Yeah, it happens. It happens. And it, yeah, and it and like, I've I've had the 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 instant like certain times where basically like they'll even change things like boost the contrast or, yeah. uh, different you know certain things like that where you're just like what did you, I just yeah. I paint I painted it and yeah. you just you know that it's just crazy but you so, know values and then they just screw yeah he, sp he spent all this time like yeah. you know but uh, i i can't remember who i mean I've, I've talked with so many different artists but you know i've heard from different artists that have told me before like like years ago when i would get super stressed about those things they'd be like hey you know, just remember you're doing this you're you're hired to to try to make them look as good as possible you're trying to do something for them and it's it's theirs basically yeah. for this thing. And so just, you know, and it's yeah. kind of a, cause you know, we, we put so much into it that we're, we feel so connected, yeah. you know, and it's, it's so it, you know, like you see it and you're like, Oh, that's not what I was thinking. But you know, you just got to kind of get over it and get over yourself and, yeah you know, but it is exciting though. It's exciting when it all comes together just right. And you're just like, Oh, that's awesome. You know, that's, it's a good feeling, man. Like and you've it. done so many, you've done like what, like, like 150, 200 book covers, something like that? Well, closer to, yeah, it's probably more than like 225 at this point. I, I don't even count anymore, but I know I know it's, I've slowed down on my cover rate, um, I shouldn't say cover rate, my cover output in the last few years because I'm trying more and more to do my own IPs. Like I mentioned Loteria, that's yeah. like a four, you know, 54 card series. That's Then you talk about me trying to work on this children's book project and I've, I've known for a while now that I need to be shifting toward artist author stuff where I'm, I'm writing or, or creating the intellectual property, you know, and, as well as obviously doing the visuals. And so to do that, that means I can't be working at the same, you know, exactly. Output. Yep. Yeah. That's a tough thing. That was one of the things I was really excited about when we, when I saw you at Lightbox Expo was getting to interact with artists who are, who are doing that. I mean, even this podcast that you're doing is something where it's, it's a vehicle that you've created. That's, you know, it's your own thing. You own it. It's your it's your deal. And um, I find that I, I try to encourage a lot of artists out there to find something where, especially when we're sort of guns for hire, um, find some sort of pocket, whether it's a project that you're working on on your own, where you're writing and drawing it or working on it with a collaborator or even a podcast like this, where you've got sort of your own vehicle that you sort of own. Um, I find that that helps to make the work for hire, gun for hire stuff. I, there, there's some level of stress that just kind of gets taken off of it because you do have some ownership in something. And I found mm. that's been more and more important to me as I've gone along. Um, I've always kept the copyright on all of my work, like Star Trek. I don't own the copyright on that. X-Men. I don't own the copyright on that stuff. Um, Song of Ice and Fire, the George R. R. Martin stuff. I actually own the copyright to all of my work on that. So I've been able to, with George's permission, um, make prints of it. And he's been very kind about that. But he owns the trademark on the characters, and I have to always make sure I yeah yep. Polished. But for the mm. most part, all of my stuff I've owned copyright on it, and made sure I hold on to that so that I, if I want to make prints of things, I can. So I yeah. need to do that as well. Yeah, that's important. That's really yep. cool. Yep. Um, well, before we get going here today, uh, this has been an awesome talk, by the way. I really enjoyed just like chatting yeah. about this stuff with you. It's really cool, man. Yeah. It's it's awesome. Just I love hearing. Um, just like your perspective on this too, because it's just such a different uh, world from me. Like, you know, the fact that you've done so many book covers is just amazing. Um, you know, it's like, it, 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 it doesn't, doesn't it weird you out? Like if you think about it, cause like I, I look back and just think about for myself, like how many illustrations I've done, 
Um, and it just, it's kind of a cool thing. Like after all these years of doing it, you're just like, wow, man, I did a lot of pictures. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of an interesting thing, but to be able to have that catalog of work and, um, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, man. And like I said, if, uh, anybody, um, uh, we'll, we'll shout out your, your website at the end here, but sure. definitely got to check out the website because like I said, in the beginning, uh, so much work on there and it's it's just so awesome to see just the the variety um even like you're, i was gonna talk to you about this before but i forgot but like your, your use of color um and your color themes like behind you obviously you've got like this cooler um uh, temperature for this particular piece but like you know then you've got your co your covers that are just all like raging reds and oranges and just create you know but i'm looking through your portfolio and it's just like just just so many amazing images to look at. So it, as an inspiration for other artists, that's got to be kind of cool because um, I'm sure a lot of people, artists contact you and, um, you know, with, with that in mind. But when you have a, when you've built up a catalog that with that many covers, that's pretty, that's pretty quite an accomplishment, man. It's like, it's pretty awesome. Um, it's the job. I love yeah, it. It's, I love it's it. cool. Do you now? This is a weird question, but do you have copies of every one of the books? Because you got you have a whole library of. <laughs> you know what that you know what that reminds me of? Have you seen uh, Dumb uh, not Dumb Dumber? Uh, what about Bob? Yeah, um, that one. What is that one? What, oh, is what that? about Bob? Oh my gosh, you have to watch that. It's, it's one of Bill Murray's best movies ever. But there's a really funny scene at the beginning with um, Richard Dreyfus is his doctor, his psychiatrist. And he goes and uh, he, he's trying to hire him as his new psychiatrist. And he goes, um, the doctor's like talking to him a little bit about different things. And, you know, you know, he, he, at one point he goes, you know, there's this, there's a brand new book out that might be helpful to, help for to, ugh, helpful to you. And he walks over and he just goes, uh, oh, here it is. And it's, it's just like shelves of his book it's like all it is it's just like three three or four shelves he's like hmm, there's this great new book out uh oh oh yeah and he pulls it out and it's only 49.99 and he like hands it to him and i think it's called baby steps or something like that but it's just kind of funny because i also like so i just imagine like you, you've got like a library of like yeah this is uh these are some books and oh i happen to do all of the covers um I totally have it, but you know the trick with that is I keep it out of the studio. Like I've always oh, yeah. pathological thing about you don't put the awards in the studio, you don't put yeah. the books that you've done in the studio. I do have some of my art up in the studio, but I it's 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 a it's almost like a, a jinx thing. Like do you just keep that stuff <laughs> you're done with it? It it you 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 made it you made it so that it would be part of the world. So keep it that way. Don't keep copies of <laughs> stuff in the studio. So yeah, there there are shelves down in the front room where it's like that's all of my stuff. You know, like that's cool uh, though. Yeah, I mean, but I but I don't put it in the studio because I don't want to be looking at it. Once it's out, it's out. It's gone. <laughs> well, I have um, a bunch of my books covers and different things, but I don't look at them. <laughs> They're just there. Like <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but I do keep them, and I and I and I always want copies. And the tough thing is like when your stuff gets published in China, or I mean, like like literally, there's a Chinese edition of it, or you know, German or Belgian, or and trying to get copies of those, I find I used to try to be very like, you know. Like almost like a checklist. Like, oh, there's three other editions, international editions elsewhere, and I've just given up on that stuff. Forget it. You know. It oh, is that's funny. Yeah. Um, it's a fun life. Uh, so what I was gonna say, and I totally went off track, but whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, we're having fun. Uh, I we've got some fan art to show you. So I wanted to show you yeah. some some fan art that some you know people did from all over the place. There's cool. not too many, but there's there's enough to to uh, enjoy here. So let me flip over real quick, share my screen with you. Um, let me know if you see this. Get a sip of water real quick. <laughs> I love it. That's funny. That's me after three <laughs> days of all nighters. My God, <laughs> I like the. You know what? I what I really find funny about this, besides everything, is that lump that's right there on my forehead. I mean, like. My hair basically kind of shapes just like my um, my skull. And I've got a Frankenstein skull, literally, and it's like that protrusion. <laughs> I mean, that person who who is this, who did this? This is really insightful. 
This uh, is this is by um, Jacques Lemonnier. Yeah, I, that that's not. <laughs> that I don't think everybody would pick up on, but they really did. I mean, and I, I've got, they're symmetrical, but they only did it on one side. But that's that's a pretty cool pickup right there. A lot of the other stuff seems a little more obvious, like the balcony tooth and everything else. But uh, that's a cool one, uh, Jacques. You said Jacques. Good one, Jacques. Yeah, yeah. On, the, on my Frankenstein uh, <laughs> feeling there. Good one. Very good. I like it. I like it. Here, here's this. This is another one that looks kind of Frankensteinish. That's different. Yeah, this, they got it. You know, it's, theme here. This is by yeah. Dominic Zeilinger, by the way. It's too good, Do, Dominic. Yeah, good job, man. I, 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 again, I like the Frankenstein thing. There's something both Frankenstein and vampiric all at the same time. I, I think it's because <laughs> of the sharpness of those ear shapes, you know, descending there with the lobes, and of course they 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 nailed the balcony tooth as well. So, good one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, just a real quick aside, there's um, the, the, the school district that I, I grew up in, they've, they've um, foolishly uh, decided they're giving me some sort of weird lifetime achievement award, which is bizarre when your high school does something like that. And so they're asking for photos of me as, from like baby on up, which is like <laughs> the worst thing I could ever, ever want for anyone, especially like, <laughs> to look at photographs of myself. And we found, you know, one of my favorite photographs is this one. I'll just describe it. So it's like a circa 1970 photo of me with my father in a pea green suit, my mother in this this <laughs> dress that has colors that just really shouldn't be going together, and then me in this little bib overall thing, and my head is just the way it is now, and it's just like this little square, almost afro, and just this blocky little skull, and it's all teeth, and it's it's. it's <laughs> Right here, they both That's got good job. good job. Both of you, you should just send them this one, just yeah. like here you go. Here you go. <laughs> nice. That's funny. This this oh, one is by Walid Shihab. What well, say the first name? Walid. Walid, nice one, Walid. I love I, I love Walid's approach. This is so great. This sort of bizarro cubistic. Thing. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Oh my God, that's. You know, there's a lot of people who do quote unquote cubism and I find that they're just not really they're just it's just a label. It's a brand that they're that they're yeah. exercising as opposed to a technique or a way of seeing. But it, 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 what I like about this is that I feel like there's me a lot of me in there, but it's making me making me look at me in a whole different way. Yeah. But I find it actually somewhat appealing. This is really cool. I like kind of like the tousledness of the hair. Um, yeah, now that's all of it. I love the shapes. Um, and, and just by the way, um, I don't know if you got, if you had a chance to check out, but I, I did a talk with Bobby Chu recently. He I was saw, on episode 100. Oh, you saw that one? I saw a piece. Uh, yeah. Okay. At the watching. very at the very end of it, I interview uh, five different artists that have been submitting their art like this to my podcast for the last year. Uh -huh. And the first three I've just shown you, I, I interviewed all three of them. And um, so it's kind of cool to like, you know, it was kind of cool to just hear their, you know, what they've been up to. And like Waleed uh, was there uh, uh, in Beirut during that huge like explosion. Oh, my God. That and uh, yeah, so we talked about that and like, you know, how his windows and doors were shaking and the whole, you know, pretty crazy. But, um, but yeah, a lot of these guys have submitted work um f for so many episodes of my podcast so it's really cool to see them uh like and he really kind of changes and explores and pushes his technique and his approach and so it's pretty cool do you mind real quick man just hold on hold that a sec i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna just i know this is gonna be able to be seen later but i'm just gonna take a quick snap of that to sh show my wife all right i, I, oh, I can i can email these to you as well cool oh. yeah anyway so far they've all been really fun that's cool Oh, wow, this one really nailed my hair. My God. <laughs> a little helmet of hair. By, uh, Joseph Bryant did this one. That's funny. Yeah, that's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It looks like my nose, though, like, like, like I basically like went full linebacker and got just smushed. <laughs> but he got, got a lot of stuff. Wrong. Excuse me. Cheeks and the, the eyes, are, I think, are they're, that's fairly close. Yeah, with like the hair and the, the, the forehead, my God. Yeah, that's like looking at the hair. Although I think there's more silverish going on, but that's probably the fault of the reference or something. But yeah, it's, it's been 2020, man. I don't think we have to say any more than that, right? Yeah. 
or I got a little more salt going up here in the pepper than. Uh, than yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> hey, good job. That's funny. Who is this again? Who is this one? Joseph Bryant. Good job, Joseph. Yeah, cool. That hair is right <laughs> on. <laughs> oh wow! Check that out. That's hysterical. Who's this? Uh, this, this is a. Uh, uh, wait. Oh, sorry, I couldn't read it from here. Graziano De Car De Carolo. Oh my gosh, I said that so bad. De Carolo, I think. Oh, cool. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> I said that so bad. Terrific, <laughs> terrific picture. I mean, again, you know, it's one of the joys of this line of illustration is it, you know, makes people look at subjects that they're very familiar with in a completely different way. And this one isn't quite so much in terms. I mean, obviously, the exaggeration of the forehead and the hair, which is so true <laughs> it, it deserves to be exaggerated but uh but it's making me look at myself especially in just kind of the weariness of the eyes it's making me look at myself like yeah it's probably there's probably more truth in that than than the than the reality <laughs> right here that's really good and like i'm feeling I, I feel like that right now i gotta tell you i went to bed at 11 woke up at three and this is the way i feel so uh, nice one i like the lone boy kind of wedged in there too good job Lone Boy is my uh, my imprint for doing oh. stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice one. Hey, it looks just like me. That looks pretty yeah. good. That's yeah, this cool. one is by uh, Christine Verratti. That's cool. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, she said it was drawn on an iPad, I think. Oh, wow. Wow. I think. Totally. I don't know. Yeah, no. From... It's like what you said earlier. I mean, the, these things can be done digitally. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times I'm not going to be able to figure it out you know I, I would just assume they're true yeah. it doesn't matter just like you said earlier you know it's just it's what what what's their take what's their view it's them handing taking their eyes out of their sockets and handing them to us and saying look through my eyes and this is how i see the world or in this case this is how i see this dopey guy and uh, <laughs> so, far, so far so good oh, that's, that's fun. funny that's fun that's, that's funny yeah, yeah. um so uh, thank you, everybody, for for that. That was really cool. Um, it's really, it's a, yeah, it's always fun to see those. Um, I I finally found that book, the book that I'm, I might be doing. So I wanted to. If you, I don't know if you heard of this before, but it's called Count Zero, and it, it was written by William Gibson. Oh yeah, he's a small time author. Nobody's ever heard of him. He's a um, yeah, dude. That's one of the big biggest names in all of science fiction. I mean, <laughs> Like, like just real talk here yeah how much of a science fiction reader are you and there's no wrong answer here no i i don't have i i listen to a lot of audio books um while i'm working but i don't have much time to actually like read novels so are you direct <laughs> with bill on this are you directly working with him on it or um with I, i'm not like i said i'm not even sure yet um all i've known is right so far is that my agent is been in talk and they want me to do it, and I'm just waiting. I've been waiting for like two months now. Like, for, when are we gonna get going on this thing? <laughs> he's a he's so. a big deal. He's one of the biggest deals. So he wrote a book called Neuromancer back in 1984, I think. Um, I'm sure if I'm wrong, somebody's gonna correct that. But yeah. that book essentially was the birth of cyberpunk and the birth of sort of fiction about the internet i mean it, it 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 is it is his work is a progenitor to the matrix absolutely you said that yeah at the top of the of, of the talk and i it, it piqued my ears because i was like well that starts starts to narrow down the selection set <laughs> um, jesus i mean you are talking about a guy who absolutely was one of the founding fathers of what it, but he's he goes way beyond cyberpunk i mean bill william gibson is a big deal he's a he's a huge one i'll say this without giving too much detail here. Um, gosh, this is about 13 years ago. I'm on the jury for something called the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. Um, this is uh, based in Seattle. It's part of the Jimi Hendrix Experience Museum slash Science Fiction Hall of Fame. And they were uh, they had a seven-person jury. I was on it for that year to pick who were going to be the people that were going to be inducted. And um, you could pick four inductees. And there was this one and I'm not going to give that name because I'm not going to give this person up, but there was a problem in the process where three people really did not like this individual and the other three were very passionately in support of the individual. And I was the seventh vote. And I said, I'm going to ask that we table this discussion because there's such, 
you know, such aggressive polarity, or is that the word I want to say? But basically, this it was polarizing this argument. Mm. That um, this is going on too long too, and I'm going to say that we look at a few other candidates, and it's like, well, who else are you going to look look at? And it's like, well, we have an age limit here where you're only allowed to consider people who are, I think, 60 years old or older. And I said, there's there's a name on this list who's not able to make that cut because they're just by a few months off from the age cut. But I think this person already, even if they died tomorrow, has made such an impact on the field that this person really should be considered, especially considering what this person is still doing and probably will do in the next several years. And I just think that the body of work already justifies it. And that person was William Gibson. And when I brought him up and made a case for him, almost like a lawyer, where I kind of created a <laughs> to say, this is, these are his qualifications and this, this is why Bill matters. I've never met him before. I think to this day, I don't think we've ever met in person. But I basically pitched it to the jury. And from then on, I think it was one day, one day's worth of deliberations, and it was done. He was in the Hall of Fame. So That's awesome. A small part in getting Bill Gibson into the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. But man, that guy <laughs> was what did the job, not me. But he's fantastic. He's an amazing author. Congrats, man. Yeah. That's a great gig. That's a fun gig. Yeah, that, that's I'm that's why I'm excited about it because, like I said, I I, yeah. I I started reading about the book and I you know there's a bunch there's a, obviously like you said people know who he is and his books are really popular. So I started it's 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 kind of a cool thing that the book's already been out for so long. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like, um, you know, that's why I have a little bit of questions about like I mean, did I expecting like a you know. Because people are so familiar with it already, with this book, you know. Uh, so I definitely, I think I'm getting a copy of it. So hopefully I get a copy soon. And but like I said, I haven't heard from them. My my first step with it is going to be, um, you know, going back and forth with whoever. I don't even know who the contact is yet. So I'm kind of at that early stage where, yeah, you know, where what do you guys want from me? And you know how we, you know, that kind of a thing. But I'm yeah. excited about it. Leave, leave your sandbox as wide open as far as boxing yourself into what things should look like, because you just you've already kind of tapped into a very important insight in what you just said, which is this book has existed for a certain amount of time. It has a certain level of notoriety, although I don't know how if it's one of his biggest books, but there's a certain awareness or preconceived idea of what this book could be or should be and how it's packaged. Mm hmm. And what you have realized is that that, that, that that condition exists. So now you have the opportunity to either play on that note or play against it. And so, like, for instance, when I did this cover for a book called Invasion of the Body Snatchers, it was the 60th anniversary edition of this book. And it was going to come out in a mass market paperback. And even if you've never seen the film or read the book, you kind of already know that story in your head. Even the title itself is almost like a yeah. shock by itself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can get sort of trapped into the thing of like, well, I need to do it the way these things have done it before, but I want to play off of them and I want to do my own version. You can play that game if you want, and, and lots of people do. And what, what I looked at it as was, well, this book was written in 1954, and it was written under these conditions, but this book is going to come out in, I think at that time it was 2015, and I was working on it in 2014, but it was going to come out the next year. And these are, this is a very different world. But there are certain things that are parallel between these times, but there, there's a whole different viewpoint now than there was then. And I get to decide where I want to play on that spectrum. And I decided to play this thing very differently than any cover ever was for this book. And I did that very pointedly. And I even made my pitch to the publisher and the client, the art director, saying that there's a romance, however small it is in this thing, that's sort of the seed of the emotional fulcrum for the book and yeah it's all about the aliens and about the takeover etc but it's also about how these people are afraid to disappear and there's something ephemeral and poignant about this very sort of rudimentary depiction of this relationship along with this theme of being scared to disappear that i think a lot of us feel right now and it was a little heady but mm -hmm. well there, there you go that's that's kind of the way mm -hmm. i think sometimes but i i thought that if I can put that into an illustration, not only will it be different from any other book, but it might also make people pick up this book who would normally just say, oh, that's just science fiction. But I'm, I'm still going to make a very science fictional cover. I'm never going to sit there and make a cover for science fiction that's going to try to fool people and say, oh, it's not science fiction. I'm yeah. proud of science fiction. I'm proud of fantasy. I'm a fan of that stuff. 
I'll always fly the flag, but I wanted something that would surprise people who maybe even have already read the book and make them say, oh, that's a different take. Okay, you know what? I want to go back and rediscover this book because that, that cover, I've never seen one like that. So you can, mm. there's a lot of different ways you can play on the spectrum. So don't, don't worry so much about how the thing has been. I think going back and looking at how it's been packaged before, go get that out of your system. I always do that anyway when I've done yeah. a, doing a book that's had other incarnations. I'm always going to want to know. That's, there's no, that's good stuff. But don't be afraid to play against that stuff and just say, yeah, but it's never done this. And when you read the book, you're going to see elements that, well, this stuff's never been sort of portrayed in a cover before. And, you know, again, you're thinking about how this book is going to address not only the time that it gets published in this particular edition, but also the audience of who is going to be seeing this. Now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you're, you're the caretaker of that. That's always, that's such fun stuff, man. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about this. Like, you know, like I said, it's been like a couple a couple months now, and I'm just like, kind of getting a little antsy. Like, come on, I'm, I want to get I want to get going with it. So I'll yeah. let you know, and I'll definitely uh I'll I'll uh run some I'll send some stuff by to see what you think and stuff. So, cool. um, but yeah, thank thank you so much uh, for your time and for talking, man. This has been a real fun time and uh, really cool. Get a little insight into your your uh your life as an artist, man. I really appreciate it. Right and um and now r r before we go is there you want to promote um, uh, some of your maybe your socials or different things so people can follow you yeah. some stuff coming up or I enjoyed this man and I I love meeting you at Lightbox and this has been a joy so yeah I feel like this likewise going to be ongoing and yeah you reach out anytime and that goes for everybody else out there if you have any questions or need some advice or just you know some clarification about any of the the mumbo jumbo that's been coming out of my mouth in the last whatever it is <laughs> Uh, you can hit me up at my, uh, go, go to my website. My contact info is there, but it's just www.johnpicasio.com, J-O-H-N-P-I-C-A-C-I-O.com. Um, my social is at John Picasso. That's my Twitter and my Instagram. So again, it's just J-O-H-N-P-I-C-A-C-I-O with the at sign. Uh, I guess if there was one thing I would throw out there is, um, you know, right now we're here closing in on mid-October. We're all kind of trying to figure out what the hell does Halloween look like in a pandemic? What is uh, Dia de los Muertos? Yeah, I'm 100% I'm Mexican American, so what does that look like in a pandemic? And so I think all of us have had to make adjustments uh, in how we survive during this time. One of the things I did was I created a mask uh, based off of one of my Lothadia artworks. So that's, in fact, the artwork is right here. This is this piece oh, here. Cool. Into a mask. So if people want to go check that out, feel free. It's right there. It's right on the homepage at the website. Um, in fact, I've got one awesome. here. I'll hold it up. So I don't know if people can see that. Oh, that's so cool. It's like a half version. It's actually a full mask that has the full artwork, but that's folded down in sort of the half mask there. So yeah, they're a they're really fun. And uh, I've got them over there at the website. But really, it's about knowledge. And so if people have any uh, questions, hit me up. I'll, I'm there for you. But thanks, man. That's awesome. Thanks yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, um, thank you so much for your support. And we'll see you next week. Take care. You want answers?